welcome to our official stamp cancellation for the town of Bridgewater. And glad to see everybody's here. I just like, well, first of all, thank you everyone for, for coming out to this. Uh, on our birthday, 125 years, it's, uh, it's something quite special for the town. Um, and I want to I wanna thank uh, the Sister Stamp Club for for this, uh, the stamp cancellation, right? Is that the, the pictorial stamp cancellation? Yes. I have in my pocket the last one uh, that I keep in my office at Town Hall from 2017, yes. where we had the one for Bidjanuiska Park, uh, which also has the nice stamp on it for the park. Um, so I have a couple of these that are on display, so whenever I'm meeting with developers or business uh, people interested in coming to our town you know, to uh, start a new business, this is one of the things they see. Um, and so to mark our 125th birthday, with another, uh, I, I find these obviously they're unique, but they're also very special. I think it's very good. So thank you all for uh, for putting this together and for being here today. Anyways, thank you everybody for coming for our uh, Bridgewater 125. And uh, the Philatelic Society has asked us to produce a cancellation commemorating this event, so which we have done, and it's turned out with very positive reviews. And Canada Post is really, pleased to be involved with uh, supporting Phil Tug Society and Bridgewater. So of course, it's just been a great time. So the cancel is officially released as of right now. And uh, please take part in some of the festivities. We have coffee, tea, donuts, uh, anything you folks like. So <laughs> thank you very much. Thanks for yeah. the yeah. Thanks, folks.
I'm Amanda Fancy. I'm the dealer owner of Gals Home Hardware and Furniture. We've been at this location for about a year. We started in 1848, uh, way back when. Um, this is our fifth location, so um, you know we've we've never uh, have left the town limits. So when we're looking to build this location. You know we had lots of opportunity to potentially look at um, you know outside of the town limits, uh, but it was really key for us to be um, and continue to be um, a growing business in Bridgewater. Bridgewater, Nova Scotia is unique. We have a beautiful countryside. Our, our town is 7,500 people, but then, you know, our customer reach is about 45,000. So, you know, we're talking about lots of small communities, um, you know, hidden treasures. There's huge opportunity here, and I think that it's certainly worthwhile to, uh, to make the visit, uh, make the call, do some inquiring, this, because it certainly is uh, somewhere where I think there would be some uh, you know, strong investment opportunities for sure. My name is Joey Richard. I come from Quebec, Montreal. Um, I've studied opera at the Montreal Conservatory of Music, so this is where I've learned about Italian, the language, and the food. And my passion just became bigger and bigger for food. I've been cooking for 20 years, almost. I opened a family business, but the only thing I forgot is that my family is still in Montreal so I'm like you know I'm trying I make new friends I, I I'm building this thing but it is a family business here my chef is like my brother his wife is like my sister so I mean I, I recreated a family uh, environment we do the real recipes starting from the real ingredients and for Italian food what the secret is few ingredients and very fresh so each recipe would be like three four ingredients maximum but i mean it's just the best ingredients and makes it so delicious if you think that it's impossible to have your own business i'm the living proof that it is possible people want us to thrive we work together so it, everybody helps each other if you want to be part of a community it is the community to be part of My name is Joel Holland. I'm the owner and operator of Manitou Athletics. I found the opportunity, started this gym in my parents' garage, and now we are currently in an 8,600 square foot facility. A lot of people come here because of the community. The, the things that we offer here are different than a normal gym. It's an open atmosphere where you come in, the music's played over the loudspeakers, not in your ears. You don't put earbuds in and uh, just walk around from one machine to the other. You, uh, you focus on yourself, but at the same time you get to meet new people. We have three floors, uh, which we do CrossFit, uh, boot camps, athletic training, and personal training. We have so many other businesses that are growing our economy and, uh, and feeding into it becoming more populated. A place where people actually stay as opposed to leave. All right, good evening, everyone. I will call this regularly scheduled meeting of Bridgewater Town Council to order. And as always, the town of Bridgewater is located in, in Mi'kmaq, the unceded ancestral territory of the Mi'kmaq people, and it is our privilege to be here. Um, are there any additions or deletions to the agenda? Hearing none, can I have a motion to approve the agenda as circulated? Mm -hmm. Councilor McDonald, seconded by Councilor Tanner. All those in favor? Those opposed? The motion is carried. Um, I'm going to be talking very fast because we have a lot of things to get through in this <laughs> agenda, but um, obviously we're going to have lots of time for discussion and debate. But our first item is a presentation 
for the uh, 2024 Individual Volunteer Award to Mustafa Maynard, and I'm going to ask Deputy Mayor Fougier to read the bio and welcome Mustafa to come forward and um, come on up front and center. We could stand here awkwardly while she reads all the great yeah. things about you. <laughs> so Mustafa Maynard is the recipient of the 2024 Provincial Volunteer Award presented by the Parks, Recreation, and Cultural Advisory Committee. Known as Coach Moose, he has been a coach to hundreds of local youth and a mentor to many others. He has dedicated many hours to the local youth basketball programs for more than 10 years. He, his love and passion for the sport shows through his coaching skills and te techniques both on and off the court. His dedication to our children is admirable. He has coached many levels, many programs, and has expanded his own local basketball club, the South Shore Lightning Basketball. He has also been honored as the 2024 Nova Scotia True Sport VIP coach due to the many coaching courses he has done. Congratulations. Thank you. 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 Thank yeah, kind of a quiet summer, uh, except for we had the carnival on the weekend that was well attended. Uh, and then tomorrow we have music on the riverbank again, as we always do. So good time to, looks like the weather's going to be good, so grab something to eat, bring it down to Bijanuska Park for some great music. Um, so if there's nothing else, we'll get down to our delegations. We've got a couple here. So I know Nancy Green is here um, with the South Shore Housing Action Coalition. and. Um, going to talk about why non-market housing options matter. So welcome, Nancy. So just a reminder, you have 10 minutes to present to council, but that doesn't include any questions that we may have. Yeah. And the floor is yours. Great. Thank you. Good evening, Mayor, Council members, and community members and staff. Um, I'm pleased to be joining you this evening on behalf of the South Shore Housing Action Coalition. Um, briefly, I'm here to share information about the importance of non-market housing options for our communities, current housing realities, opportunities for action, and to bring forward some considerations for Council. SHAC is an act active coalition which has been working since 2012 to build awareness and facilitate action on the need for improved access to healthy, safe, and affordable housing options across Lunenburg and Queens counties. We believe housing is a human right. It is enshrined in Canadian law through the National Housing Strategy. We can all appreciate the importance of having a healthy, safe, and stable place to call home. It impacts our health and well-being, our communities, and the economy. We all have a responsibility to ensure that everyone in our community has access to healthy, safe, and affordable housing options that reflect the changing needs of, the changing of housing needs throughout life. So why do non-market housing options matter? Well, let's look at what we do know about housing in Bridgewater. Sorry. The ability of a household to live in a community is not solely related to the housing options available. There are a number of community dynamics at play, some of which are noted on this slide. The current housing situation is reflective of the dynamics between housing, population, and economic realities. For context, I've also added uh, on the right-hand side of the or right-hand side of the slide some new data regarding poverty in Nova Scotia. Nova Scotia has the highest rate of poverty and the highest rate of food insecurity among the provinces, and the child poverty rate for Lunenburg County has increased by nearly 10 percent since 2020. Certainly, the growing need in our communities is contributing to the current housing situation. You will notice at the bottom that among low-income families in Nova Scotia. Nearly 70% are spending more than 30% of their income on shelter-related costs, and nearly 40% are spending 50% or more. 
On this slide, you see the housing spectrum, which shows the range of housing options required for the health and sustainability of communities and reflects the changing needs of households. Those within the yellow box note where non-market housing options exist. Currently, there are very few non-market housing options in Bridgewater. The Nova Scotia Public Housing Agency operates 135 units, 11 of which are for families, and 124 of those units are de designated for seniors. Dr. Catherine Levitin reed from Cape Breton University re recently shared that 89% of rental housing stock is privately owned and operated in Nova Scotia. There has traditionally been little investment in an intentional focus on non-market housing options in Nova Scotia. We have looked instead to the housing market to meet needs. However, we know that it is unable to meet the needs of everyone. The market controls the vast majority of rental housing and is much needed. But other than the rent, current rent cap placed on occupied units, there is little regulation to protect the affordability of housing. <coughs> Even the affordability standards set by CMHC are based on average market rents. So the market is determining affordability rather than affordability being reflective of what households can afford. Supporting the development of non-market housing options is an opportunity for investment in the community and can help ensure affordability of housing. Affordable housing is housing that is affordable, and that depends on a number of factors, including household income, size, and their needs, etc. And we encourage you to examine your local context to determine what affordability looks like for Bridgewater. The information on this slide is meant to provide some perspective to affordability in the town. Spending more than 30% of household income on shelter costs, which includes your rent, your mortgage, utilities, insurance, etc., <coughs> is an indicator of financial strain and is a marker for affordability in a community. The first numbers on this slide show what a household would need to be earning to afford average shelter costs in Bridgewater, as reported on the census. The average shelter cost for 10 in households in Bridgewater is $966 a month, and for homeowners, $955 a month. To the right-hand side, side of the slide, we see that a single minimum wage earner household who works 40 hours per week could afford shelter costs that do not ex exceed $730 a month. Finally, the bottom portion of the slide shows an affordable shelter cost for various households earning a median income in Bridgewater. And you can see that even those households with a median income are struggling with affordability. The Nova Scotia Housing Needs Report for Bridgewater provides further evidence that home that home ownership and rental housing is unaffordable for many households in the community. There has been a lack of ongoing qualitative and quantitative data collection about the housing needs in our region, which has resulted in the invisibilization or misunderstanding of the extent of the need for housing for all in our communities. The housing need report has brought some light to the issues our current communities are currently facing. And I've just included on the slide here some snippets from that report. A resident survey shows us that housing options are limited, households have left or are considering leaving as a result. Affordability and availability of housing is a concern for many, and the rising cost of living is having an impact. We also know that housing insecurity and homelessness exists. We know that the use of, of fixed-term leases and seasonal evictions are contributing to housing insecurity locally within the region. And that the access to public housing, coupled with long wait lists, indicates that our current non-market options are insufficient for the need. We believe the growth of non-market housing options is necessary to address these issues. There is an opportunity for the town to intentionally support the development of non-market housing options to ensure affordable, accessible, and suitable housing options for those whose needs are not able to be met by market housing. And we do, want, we do acknowledge that the town has been taking a number of steps forward um, and in the right direction to identify and prioritize actions to address housing need. Of course, the work that is happening through Bridgewater, Energize Bridgewater is wonderful. Um, we were happy to see the initiatives identified in the town's Housing Accelerator Fund application last year, um, and we hope that those will continue regardless of funding. Um, you've offered support to non-market housing developers in the community, 
And it, this should say your Bridgewater Housing Action Plan, not Affordable Housing Plan, but I quickly scanned that this afternoon and was pleased to see the effort that has gone into that and the focus on, on addressing some of the housing needs in the community. So kudos to you. Thank you for your efforts. Finally, we ask you to consider how are you going to prioritize and support non-market housing development? What actions can the town take to address the needs of all residents? And we offer up the following uh, as opportunities. Implement your housing accelerator fund initiatives regardless of funding approval. Or apply again. I hear it's open again. Um, we encourage you to look beyond the numbers to understand experiences of housing need in Bridgewater. Engage and bring attention to the voices that are not being heard. And I don't know if you do, you may already receive SOTA's monthly data reports at Council, um, but we would encourage you to consider doing so. We encourage you to also use available information to make evidence-informed decisions. I would say our communities have never had more data about housing, um, ever. <laughs> so build on that. Seek to understand what those opportunities are and learn about best practices. Explore the tools that are available to address housing needs and pressures. Um, we encourage you to support community capacity for the development of non-market housing options. So learn about what other communities are doing. Advocate for changes to enable or support non-market housing development. And partner and engage in the community uh, to explore opportunities. And I know that work has been happening. Uh, we'd also encourage you to learn more about non-market housing types, such as housing trusts and co-ops, uh, and assess where the community is if there's an opportunity. Uh, and we'd also encourage you to connect with and possibly become a member of the non Nova Scotia Nonprofit Housing Association and continue to be engaged in our coalition. Finally, I'll leave you with this. You have the power to have an impact and leave a legacy. The decisions you make today will have impacts in the future. It is your decision to make with the best interests of your community in mind. So consider the evidence, the experiences, the needs, and your opportunities and options. Your community is counting on you. Thank you. That's it. Thanks, Nancy. Um, any questions from Council? Councillor Tanner. Nancy, do you have examples from other municipalities, preferably in Nova Scotia or within Canada at least, that are achieving this? There are examples of municipalities where, you know, land has been donated, and I know that those things have been identified um, here as well. Um, you know. Perhaps things do, we're not doing. Like perhaps you things you're not reports. doing. Yeah. And it, I guess I don't need it tonight, but yeah, can yeah, we can certainly us, share that. Really um, there, there are opportunities um, for council to prioritize the development of non-market housing. I believe. Um, I'd, I'd say that there hasn't been a lot of movement in that direction in Nova Scotia generally, until recently, um, as the housing crisis has grown in Nova Scotia. I think our municipalities, you are looking for opportunities to support that need in the community. And when there are opportunities for advocacy, we'll certainly be sharing that if we see opportunities for the municipality to take action. I think Bridgewater is a really good example in our region of a municipality that has been supporting the community and exploring those needs. So we do acknowledge that. Um, in some ways, it feels like a new, a new reality for us in Nova Scotia dealing with the housing situation we are currently in. Um, and so maybe there's some novel things that can come out of this that we haven't explored before. Uh, but certainly be happy to share those with you. Okay. Good question. Other questions? Councilor Thorburn. Hi, Nancy. Hi. I served with Nancy in 2012. Mm -hmm. And uh, has the housing stock got any better? Because back in 2012, a lot of the houses was in deplorable shape and really wasn't fit to live in. Has that gotten better over time? That's a great question, Wayne. And I could, I have been tracking the data that we have from the census over time, from 2006, so each of the census, uh, looking at those numbers that are reported there in terms of housing maintenance and requirement of repairs. I'm not sure where we are with the status, but I will follow up with you and can send that along. Great. Um, I would say we certainly see a lot more new development happening in Bridgewater, but the, the demand has grown so much. Yeah. Um, that there's still a need for those those other units that currently exist and whether they're getting their upgrades I don't know but certainly through energized Bridgewater some of that is happening good. Um, yeah. yeah but good. I can certainly share the like the hard data that okay. I the little bit of hard data that I have <laughs> um, so you can 
kind of look at that trend over time and whether there has been any progress made in that regard. Great. Nice seeing you. Thanks. Nice to see you too. I certainly was uh, disappointed when our housing accelerator application didn't get approved and hoping that uh, a further opening of the fund will be more successful for us. Our issue continues to be infrastructure and then a bit of a disconnect between, I mean, we all know that other orders of government are unleashing buckets of money to build housing, but there seems to be a disconnect with Absolutely. the need. I don't think they all see the you can't really have a house connected to central water and sewer if you don't have pipes in the ground. So <laughs> Absolutely. Um, I know our, our application you pointed to it was, was amazing. Our staff did a phenomenal job. So yes. I'm really hoping, um, there's a wood, right? Knocking on wood, <laughs> that, it, that it gets approved because it would, it would check a lot of the boxes that you're, uh, you're mentioning. It really would. Um, and I think the Housing Accelerator Fund is, you know, our communities across the region, I think there was, if all of them had been funded to the full extent, it was like $40 million would have, but recognizing the need and identifying those initiatives and those things that need to be happening in the community um, is a great step. Um, and I would encourage the town and staff to reach out to the coalition as well. If there you see opportunities where advocacy or we can support in that way to help raise those concerns or those challenges that you may be facing, um, we're happy to support in any way that we can. Thank you. Any other questions? Thanks, thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, our next delegation is John McIntosh from the ARC talking about its 60th anniversary. Amazing. Good evening, Mayor, Councillors, staff, everybody here. Um, I've been asked to speak tonight. I'm the currently the president of the board of the ARC. Uh, have been since I think about 2015 so I've uh, been around the arc for quite a while um, I've been asked to speak tonight because uh, the two managers of the arc neither one of them could be here one's away on vacation I think they're actually both away on vacation right at the present time so anyway in recognition of the arc 60th anniversary we are requesting use of King Street Court on September 28th 2024 from 5 to 10 p.m. We would like to host a lantern festival where attendees will decorate a wood paper lantern supplied by the Ark and set them into the Boyd Off area in the Lahave River at sunset. All the lanterns will be removed from the river at the conclusion of the event. Uh, we have already been granted permission to close King Street on that same evening. So that's already been done. Uh, from Empire to Dominion Street during the hours of 5 to 10, same time frame. We are also requesting that porta potties be provided at both entrances to the King Street Court and the use of electricity to power lights and music equipment for DJ set up in the gazebo. Our requests have been outlined in our special events application that was submitted to the town on August 6, 2024. We look forward to celebrating our anniversary with the community and we would appreciate the support of Council. Thank you. Thanks. Uh, just stick around in case there's any questions. I know there was, there's uh, under the delegation, uh, you'll notice there's a document there. Um, so those requests are outlined for council. Yeah. I know staff had talked about um, some of these things we don't really have. Yeah. So I don't know. Do you want to speak to speak sure. that? So if there's any questions that come up, you're going to be put on spot. <laughs> Mm, I'm just a messenger. <laughs> I, I could try and answer some of the questions, but I don't know. No, no worries. We'll, we'll, I don't know. we'll figure out where to get the answer. So, yeah. Yeah, so the, um, in terms of the request that's made, the street closure, they have for there is a cost. <coughs> the closure ends have to be staffed um, to provide traffic control. So I think there was an estimated cost there around 1500 um, Port of party rental is also being requested. Um, we don't have port potties, so we mm -hmm. have to rent them. And those, those come with an estimated cost of a thousand. Um, there's additional garbage cans, we give price to that as well. Um, game boards and activities, those can be booked, and so there's no issue there. They can be picked up for the recreation, recreation bridge water um, program. Um, promotion, we can certainly do that. Um, equipment um, so the fender public address sound system is is something that we typically don't rent out simply because it's 
expensive equipment and it's required for the town events and we have a number of organizations that do ask for that but it's damaged and it impacts our ability to to provide our event so normally it would be loaned out with staff accompanying it so staff would be the ones doing the using the system so there would be a cost to provide the, the staff time to provide that um, all in all, uh, I think that we had noted that the cost would be around 4700 in terms of the in-kind cost that council is being asked to provide to the event. And as I say, the fender system is really the one thing that it would have to come with the staff person to, um, to do that. The sound system I don't think is an issue. Okay. Because the ARC would be providing, they, they've got their own sound. Okay, that's great. Like they have concerts every year, two, two or three times a year in the ARC, and they've got all the musicians, equipment, everything. Okay. So I don't think a sound system would be part of the request. All right, it was noted right. in the application anyway. So oh, okay, yeah. but I mean, I know yeah. they can provide their own sound. That would be helpful. Okay, yeah, yeah. yeah. That, that would bring the, the cost down a bit. Um, I think we had around $1,000 for staff time. Um, we don't have the buoy system either, I don't believe we do. Um, so that would be something that, line yeah, yeah. that we wouldn't be able to provide. Um, and the most we have is st string lights from Christmas on the La Have. Um, so there's, we're limited in some of the things we can do. And so I would suggest that the, <coughs> the in-kind request is around 3700 to provide everything that's requested, excluding the staff with the vendor system. Are there any questions about that? John, has the, has the ARC thought about, or your committee or whomever, uh, thought about maybe asking a couple of the porta potty providers, suppliers, to provide those given the, the um, big... The, the unfortunately, the I'm, I, don't, I don't know the answers okay. to most of the questions. Okay. Um, yeah, yeah. I don't know if they've, they've approached that issue. Sure. Um, I'm not even sure if they're... I don't see even paying some money for this being a big issue because it's it's sort of been budgeted for this year because of the 60th anniversary to the ARC. They have yeah. they have finances to if they're required to do things for this anniversary, and so I think if if they were communicated with John or Tim, it would be they could probably tell you more but I don't think I don't think monetary is an issue with the arc okay. that's good so this, yeah would, this would come back in the next uh, gender well it time, I believe the uh, the, the event is September 28th yeah. so our next first council, council meeting like is September the uh, 9th. 9th so I don't know if that gives you if it's contingent upon the town providing this as in kind meaning the town pays mm -hmm. um, I don't know if that the answer of yes or no wouldn't happen until September 9th. Um, if it's not contingent upon that, then st staff's already done the street closure, and the rest of it seems to be that you would have the funds for the porta potty and that type of thing. So the street closure would have been the big thing, which you already yeah. have, yeah. right? So, so if, if 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 what I'm hearing is is that the application asks for these things to be provided by the town. So if, if what you're saying is that you can take care of them, then it doesn't seem yeah. to be well, that. I, I think if they were communicate, if you communicated with John or Tim at the ARC and presented him that those facts that that you could make the decision if we we're going to pay for it a lot quicker, I think they would. Yeah. And, and I think the big decision there is mainly just the street closure, which has happened. Yeah. The rest of it. Um, if, if council says no on the ninth, you can still arrange your porta potties and that yeah. type of yeah. thing. Okay. Yeah. So then I think that gives us some yeah. time to ask yeah. the questions. Yeah. Well, I, w I was just <laughs> probably going to say what you were going to say is that if it comes back to the next meeting, then we could maybe have a little more clarity on yeah. the porta potties and the yeah. sound system and know exactly what it mm -hmm. is there we need to fund. Yeah. And that still gives three weeks. Yeah. Um, okay. To, that's great. Any other questions, of John? 
That's great. <laughs> okay. Um, I would I would invite the ARC to come back and do a presentation mm -hmm. about the history, like the 60 years of the ARC. Okay. I think that would be quite formative for the community. I yeah. think that's that's something that would have been um, that would be great for this okay. year. It's that's a big year. 60 years is yeah, it's not nothing. Yeah, so start, started in Lower Branch, I think, in a mm -hmm. little yeah. little building in Lower Branch is where it first started. Yeah. So. so I'd like to invite you or or someone from the Ark to come and and um, just give up give a presentation about that to council. All right. All right. I was going to say my uh, my mother was a staff member when it was out in Lower Branch, and then she managed the Ark later okay. on on there King you Street. Go. Yeah. Yeah. So cool. I have very fond, a very uh, soft spot in my heart for the Ark. That's yeah. Great. Okay. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. Thank you. Okay. Those are our uh, our delegations that uh, advise us in advance of their coming. Are there any other members of the public that wish to speak on any of the topics, any topic that's not part of the public hearings that are coming up? If not, then we will go uh, continue on. We have the minutes from the July 8th regular council meeting. Any errors or omissions with those? Hearing none, motion to approve the minutes. Councilor Tanner, seconded by Deputy Mayor Fugier. All those in favor? Those opposed? Motion is carried. Okay, and now we are going to go down to uh, item 24125B, which is a public hearing for second consideration of the R3 zone standards with some land use bylaw text amendments. So this is a public hearing. So I've got my little cheat sheet here to remind me how we do these things. So I'm going to uh, essentially recess council and call the public hearing to order. Um, I will note that all statutory requirements have been met uh, and that council's decision is, um, is covered by the municipal planning strategy. Um, so we're going to have staff speak to council and then council's going to ask any questions and then if there's any members of the public that wish to speak on this one, um, we'll kind of go through order uh, and then we'll close the public hearing and make a decision. So. Um, and I will review these for the next item as well, which is a public hearing. So um, with that, we'll turn it over to Santa and staff. Go ahead. Yeah. Uh, good evening, Council, Mayor. Um, I'm here to present the proposed text amendments to the land use bylaw regarding the R3 zone amendments. Uh, before delving into the background, uh, I want to clarify uh, the primary objective of this uh, presentation, an amendment request from Black Bay Real Estate Group to the land use bylaw to reduce the minimum lot frontage requirement for semi-detached dwelling on separate lots within uh, the R3 zone. Uh, this part is in section 445, the zoning standards table for the R3 zone on page 63 of the town land, land use bylaw. Uh, just as a reminder, the land use uh, bylaw document can be found on the town's website. Uh, during the first consideration presentation at the July 8th council meeting, uh, provided an overview of the application for 1525 King Street. Uh, where two townhouses are currently under construction as of right. The applicant explained that they wish to further subdivide the townhouse lot uh, along their shared walls to provide greater housing choice, but they are limited by uh, front frontage uh, requirements. Uh, the lot is zoned as uh, comprehensive residential and is adjacent to two uh, properties zoned as R1, highlighted in white color here. The proposed property lines subdivide the current properties from two into four, as shown in here in red. However, the problem is that the minimum lot frontage requirement, requirement can, cannot be met based on the current standards uh, in our land use bylaw. The minimum lot frontage for a dwelling on the same lot is 49 feet, as shown the left on the left. Um, if um, a property owner attempts to subdivide that dwelling into two semi-detached dwellings on separate lots, um, each with a separate owner, the minimum lot frontage based on our current requirement is 33 feet. 
This discrepancy was identified by staff. When one lot is divided into two, the size should also equally divide into two. This means that if the minimum lot frontage for one lot in the R3 zone is 49 feet, then when divided into two, the minimum lot frontage should be half of 49, which is 24.5 feet. However, the current bylaw sets, at, uh, sets it at 33 feet, which is an error. This inconsistency is more ap apparent when uh, compared to the minimum lot area requirement. As you can see here, the minimum lot area requirement is half the parent lot requirement within R3 zone. We expect the same rule uh, to apply to the minimum lot frontage requirement. Additionally, this, cha uh, this change aligns the R3 zone to other residential zones with two unit dwellings on separate lots uh, per the, this table is shown here. Therefore, staff presented the first consideration report at the July 8 council meeting during which town council approved first reading to the land use bylaw amendments and set a date for the public hearing, which is today's session on August 12. For the public hearing today's session, the first public notice was published on the town's website on July 24. The first newspaper notification was posted on July 24, followed by a second notification on July 31 in the South Shore Breaker. In this regard, staff uh, have identified this recommended option for town council to give second and final consideration of the proposed amendments to the land use bylaw, including clarifying the amount of minimum lot frontage for semi-detached dwelling two units on a separate lot of comprehensive residential zone. Thank you. Great. The questions from council? <coughs> this is second reading, so I think we had quite a few questions at the last mm -hmm. presentation. Mm -hmm. Text amendments are quite straightforward. Questions from council? Okay, that's great. Any any members of the public that wish to speak on this issue? No? Okay. Um, well, then I will uh, close the public hearing. Oh, sorry. I speak. Yep. So if you want to come on up, Rosemary, and just identify yourself and the community you live in. <laughs> My name is Rosemary Head. I live in Bridgewater up at St. Philip Street, and my husband's property is one of the properties that's looking at being rezoned. Oh, this is the this is the next item. Oh, okay. I think I'll yep. Be... No, that's okay. <laughs> 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 All right, perfect. I will uh, I will recess the uh, the public hearing and reconvene council. And if uh, someone is prepared to make a motion, continue. Councilor Shorban, thank you. I would move that Town Council for the Town of Bridgewater approve the housekeeping text amendments to the land use bylaw as contained in Appendix A of Document 24-125B to add clarity to the amount of minimum lot frontage from semi-detached dwelling two units on a separate lot of comprehensive residential R3 zone and hereby conduct second and final reading of same. Thank you. Seconded by Councilor Caldwell. Further discussion? Hearing none, all those in favor? Those opposed, motion is carried. Thank you. Thank you. Um, we will now move to our second public hearing. Uh, so I will again recess council and just uh, note again that uh, as we start this public hearing that all statutory requirements have been met. Um, staff will give their overview. Council will ask questions. Um, I will then open, it to open the floor up to the public. <laughs> no. Oh, shit. Sure. Um. <laughs> this is why we should have, always have music playing in the background. Just <laughs> <laughs> uh, bear with me for one moment. No worries. Big enough for me. All right, uh, 
I'll get started. This application is to make amendments to the special commercial C8 zone. This is the second part of a staff-led process, meaning there's no application from a separate property owner or specific developments that are proposed for the zone. This evening is the second consideration and the public hearing for the proposed amendments. I'm gonna have to jump between the two, I apologize. <clears throat> These proposed amendments are part two of a two-part process, as previously mentioned, focused on the C8 zone. Part one of this process was completed on February 12, 2024. Part two of the process is looking to rezone the remaining C8 zone properties to a suitable residential zone with the intention of eliminating the C8 zone from the planning documents. To date, staff have held a public participation meeting completed the planning analysis report for first consideration, and this evening's presentation will conclude second consideration and the public hearing. <clears throat> Moving into the specifics of the zone itself, this is a map of the subject properties. Uh, it may be difficult to see on this map, however, we will be reviewing each of the properties individually. Uh, the special commercial zone aims to permit existing commercial uses within residential areas with restrictions in place to limit their growth. Current permissions in the C8 zone include one and two unit dwellings, uh, the site specific commercial use that is permitted on uh, these individual properties, and, uh, and those are both as of right, with conditions a home based business as well as a residential conversion up to three units would be permitted, and by development agreement the following may be permitted. Uh, inns, a change to a change of use to select uh, neighborhood oriented commercial uses, as well as some expansion to the site specific commercial uses uh, within the C8 zone. Uh, now diving into the individual properties, 255 Victoria Road was formerly a host to wood product sales use. The existing designation is currently split between the limited commercial and the low density residential designations. Uh, High Street was at one point thought to be developing as more of a commercial uh, stretch. However, it's more recently seen residential uses being developed in the area. For this reason, staff is proposing the comprehensive residential R3 zone. Uh, 76 Dominion, used until recently as an automobile parts and service center, has an existing designation of medium density residential due to its central location, proximity to commercial, recreational, and institutional uses, the property is being proposed for a high density R6 zone. These two properties are the only two C8 properties within the, within the proposed, so, excuse me, with proposed redesignations uh, or amendments to the municipal planning strategy uh, before being rezoned, these properties would need to be redesignated on the future land use map. The remaining 12 properties in the C8 zone are solely rezonings, or would be solely rezonings, or amendments to the land use bylaw as they are currently aligned with the future land use map. Uh, 27 South Street was formerly host to a woodworking shop. After speaking to the property owner, uh, staff have confirmed that the current use is solely residential. 276A St. Philip Street was formerly hosted Greeks Meats, uh, a meat packing and retail location. The use and the structure have both been removed from the property and the property is now vacant. <coughs> 56 Star Street was last known as an electrical installation and repair use. However, the commercial use has not been known to be in operation for some time. Uh, 239 St. Philip Street uh, was previously host to a truck parking and storage use. However, the use also has not been known for some time. 1627 King Street was previously host to a machine shop. However, more recently it has been discontinued. 103 Dominion Street was previously host to dress sales making an alteration use, but has recently undergone a change of use to a home-based business. Uh, and finally, 304 Aberdeen Road has been known as a single family uh, dwelling unit by staff, but was unintentionally captured within the C8 zone due to its location in relation to the Argyle Inn, previously a C8 zone property. <clears throat> the pro proposed rezoning for eight of the 14 C8 zone properties is in line with the intent of the C8 zone. 
Following the commercial uses discontinuation, these properties are being proposed for rezoning to a suitable residential zone. The remaining six properties, which have or are said to host operational commercial uses, will be permitted to continue those uses following a proposed rezoning to a re residential zone should they, they prove their continued operation. Following the proposed rezoning, these commercial uses would be deemed a legal non-conforming use. These uses would be permitted to continue their operation as is, provided the use is not discontinued for one year or longer. Following first consideration of the proposed amendments on July 8, 2024, Council had concerns regarding specific properties and the potential for the non-conforming use or the non-conforming status. Uh, these excerpts from the MGA identify that a non-conforming use would not uh, preclude the rep repair or maintenance of a non-conforming structure or a structure containing a non-conforming use. Additionally, the change of a tenant, occupant, or owner would not affect the use of a land or structure as a non-conforming use. So these uh, six properties I'll be mentioning all contain existing commercial uses. So beginning with 1675 King, uh, it is known by staff to contain the Com Canadian Food Inspection Agency. Following first consideration, staff reached out, uh, oh sorry, uh, staff reached out to the property owner by phone and email with no response. Uh, 31 Riverview Drive is known by staff to contain an automotive repair shop. Following first consideration, staff approached the property owner who has reiterated a willingness to be rezoned as, the, as uh, R2, provided the business can continue for his business partner as a non-conforming use. Both properties are proposed for the R2 zone in line with the future land use map. 58 Elm Street uh, is host to a blacksmith shop currently undergoing renovations. Uh, staff attempted to call the property owner following first reading with no response. However, throughout the process, the property owner has indicated a desire to stay within the C8 zone. 359 St. Philip Street is known by staff to contain a towing and salvage yard. Staff have spoken to the property owners throughout the process and they also have indicated a desire to stay in the C8 zone. Both properties are being proposed for the R2 zone in line with the future land use map. 90 Pearl Street is known by staff to contain a used automobile sales use. The property owner has indicated throughout the process a desire to stay within the C8 zone. Um, it is being proposed for the comprehensive residential zone in line with the future land use map. And finally, 76 Dominion was uh, known until recently to contain an automobile parts sales and service use. The property has recently been sold. Uh, but would be permitted as a legal non-conforming use should their use be reinstated within one year from the date of the amendment. Um, the new property owner has a, an expressed a desire to stay within the C8 zone with the intention of changing the permitted use to a household repair use. A change of use within the C8 zone would entail a development agreement with council. Uh, this property would require concurrent MPS and LEP amendments for the proposed rezoning to a high density residential zone. <clears throat> the impact of these changes. Um, if these properties are to be rezoned, there would be some changes to note. The existing uses and the existing buildings on these properties could remain. If not listed within the permitted developments of the new zone, these uses would become a legal non-conforming use. Any proposed change of use would need to align with the new zone's permitted development. Staff have outlined options for council to consider uh, regarding the proposed amendments. Staff's recommendation is that council continues the process to eliminate the special commercial C8 zone, thereby rezoning the properties and creating six non-conforming uses for those properties with existing commercial uses. Alternatively, staff have laid out options for council to consider retaining some of those uh, C8 zone properties uh, within the zone and rezone the uh, discontinued uses within a residential zone. Finally, council could deny the request for amendments and retain the C8 zone resulting in no amendments. <coughs> 
In summary, staff have proposed to rezone and or redesignate the remaining C8 zone properties. If those proposed amendments were to be approved, the associated text amendments are to remove mention of the C8 zone from both the town's MPS and the LUB. And that's it from me for now. Yes, Connor. Uh, questions from council? I know we, had, we had quite a few questions at the last reading. Um, so one of my questions is, so uh, I'll use the one that's on a Dominion, so it was used car sales, and then someone is um, wants it to remain as commercial. Yes. But it's a change of use. It would entail um, a change of use. So one of the questions I have, um, I'm not just picking on your problem, I just have a general question. Um, so if something's commercial now, and it, the use is going to change. Do these changes force that? Like, if they can't do it, it has to automotive is automotive. Yes. And so, if not, it goes yeah. to residential. So the the if the proposed rezonings were to go through, any of the changes of use would need to fall within that new zone. High density residential, I don't believe, has any opportunity for commercial uses other than perhaps a neighborhood grocery store um, as part of a larger residential development. Um, if it were to stay in the C8 zone, the amendments were not to go through. There is a list of permitted developments by or permitted uses by development agreement uh, that is captured in that C8 zone. So it's a it's a list of about ten uh, uses within that zone. Where I'm kind of going with that question is understanding our water our wastewater challenges. If if this went through and that person has a commercial use now that changes and it can't and it goes to high density residential but we can't handle the infrastructure from it are we not then basically saddling that property owner with an unsellable potentially unsellable piece of property that that would be a concern um, the the wastewater capacity in, in various areas of town is limited and uh, we, we know the existing commercial use can go on uh, without a wastewater assessment. Right. Uh, through the development agreement, there would need to be uh, some downstream capacity assessments made, um, but that would kind of capture, um, be captured in a change of use within the C8 zone. Uh, whereas if you were to change to the R6 zone, uh, it, it yeah, it yeah. would it would limit the the ability for a residential development should a downstream capacity come back negatively. Right. So those that's those are my concerns. Like I don't know if the council has other questions, but to me that's a, so each that's use thing. would require to have a wastewater assessment done to determine, and it really depends on where they're located within within our exactly. sewer yeah. shed area as well. But some of these were like constraints. they look like houses. Their use was kind of residential. So going from residential to residential is very similar compared to going from a auto shop yeah. to it, you yeah, know, the household repair use. Would yeah, be proposed. yeah. So that's okay. Other questions? Like again, Councillor Tanner. But household repair is within C8, right? It's allowed. <coughs> yes, within the C8 by development agreement. So any change of all of the commercial uses within the C8 zone are site specific. Still, okay. And so any of these properties uh, mentioned currently have one permitted commercial use. Okay. There is a range of commercial uses by development agreement that could take place on those properties, but that would need to be through a council process. And, and sorry if I may just <laughs> yeah, of course. Uh, with some of the staffing changes downstairs, mm -hmm. uh, what is the timeline, expected timeline of a development agreement in this particular case? Would I you believe, guess? I have not gone through one myself. I, I believe eight to 12 months. Okay. Other questions from council? More, more may bubble to the surface as we... Mm -hmm. I would. Just, <laughs> yeah. Councilor Thorburn. Well, I'm concerned uh, with the business, especially like 359 St. Philip Street, and certainly 58 Elm Street. Riverview Drive and Pearl Street, they are part of that C8 zone. And they're still operating that business as a business, so I don't know why they couldn't stay in that zone until such time as 
the business stop because most of them uh, up on High Street and the other areas, they've long since stopped uh, the zone that they were in so they could transfer very easily. Yes. But these people, once you do this, then their hands are tied, my understanding is. No. They, they, as long as they continue the use, so I'll use the Riverview Auto One, for example, on Riverview right. Drive. So it would become a non-conforming use, but continue to be able to operate yes. as a But as only as that. As that use. As that use. No other. They'd have to so meet the... So the property owner's so hand would be tied if you wanted to sell it to put something else there. Yeah, then, so then it has to be residential. Then it would have to conform to the zone and whatever yeah. the zone allowed. Exactly. Yeah. Right. So going yeah. back to the one on, on Dominion, yeah. Yeah. right? So can you still make development, make an application for a development agreement? Or as soon as it ceases being automotive related, it flips to? No, we would have to, uh, if we're retaining the C8 zone for yeah. that property, uh, they. So no, if we put through these changes, yeah, if we okay. rezone it, based on if, if we, we if we were to rezone it, it would have to stay as an automotive use. Okay. Yeah. That, that There's no option for a commercial by development agreement. No. 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 Okay. So that. Okay. Uh, other questions from council before I open it up to the public portion of the book, Councilor Caldwell. I guess I have a uh, question about the Elm Street property. So how long would it remain uh, legal non-conforming before it would be forced to switch over? Any of these properties should a rezoning go through uh, that have existing commercial uses. They would, as long as their business is ongoing, that clock doesn't start. As soon as their business uh, is discontinued, and that would be through uh, site inspection or um, or uh, information from the property owner, uh, then that clock of one year would start and they'd have one year that they could continue operating that business. Once it's those 365 days are up, that use would no longer be considered a non-conforming use and it wouldn't be permitted on the property any longer. Other questions? Okay, we'll see if the members of the public that wish to speak. Um, just to, to just maybe mention this before, so if you come up to speak, um, just make sure you address count, address your address your questions to council, and um, if we can't answer them, we'll get staff to answer them. But um, just address them to to us. And so I just again, um, if you come up one at a time and just state your name and the community you live in. Although Rosemary, we already got you. Um, <laughs> Um, and then you can you can speak. So yeah, why is it Rosemary? Why don't you go first since you were already <laughs> keen to go? I'm never on time for anything. I'm either too early or too late. <laughs> I live on 359 St. Philip Street, and that has been a commercial designation for over 50, for just about 50 years now. We have an automotive salvage yard there. Um, I'm not sure why our property would be involved when I can see Michelin from my driveway, I can see Municipal Enterprises new outfit in and the old bus garage from my driveway, I can see Culligan's Water from my backyard, actually from my bedroom window, um, but and the smell from both Michelin and the blacktop plant is horrendous, uh, nobody up around our place uses the wash line because it's a redundant to hang your wash out in the stink from the blacktop plant. The problem being is rezoning uh, when we're dead we've got grandchildren and they may want to open up some type of a small business there and their hands will be tied at that point in time and that's all I have to say. Thank you. Any questions? <laughs> Good evening, Council. I am Kyle Walker. I am the owner of 76 Dominion, which is proposed for the rezoning. And uh, I'm not very good at public speaking, so bear with me. I uh, submitted a letter earlier to uh, Council. I don't know if you guys have read it, but uh, should I read it or? up to you. I can read it or you can read it. You can probably read better than I can. 
you want me to read it right now? Uh, if you like, yeah, sure. Okay. <laughs> um, dear Town of Bridgewater Council, Mater's Refrigeration and Air Conditioning Limited would like to be considered for a development agreement to allow the business to continue to operate at 76 Dominion Street and apply for one with this letter. I understand the rezoning bill has not yet passed as of yet, so I hope you will consider this as part of the bill. Special zone map amendments. I brought, bought this property as a business opportunity to move in town and be close to my residence at 50 Greenwood Street. It was zoned business at that time, unbeknownst to me that you were considering rezoning it. The business itself is quiet. It does not create traffic noise or undue, undue after hours disturbances. It's mainly a drop-off point for supplies and pickup of the same. It runs 8 to 5 from Monday to Friday. Of course, exceptions do occur very infrequently when emergency customer service failures happen outside these hours. I feel I meet the zoning standards, uh, section 5.9.4, and the uses of development agreement, section 5.9.3, under household repair service. I thank you all for your individual consideration of this application. So I guess uh, that's about it. <laughs> and I know I've done work for some people in here and can attest to that and keep the business going since 2005. And in order to expand, I thought this was the perfect spot to do that. And I'd like to contribute to the town and keep things going forward. Thank you. I don't know if any questions or you have any questions for council I guess just with what mr. McCreary said back there with the septic if you guys did proceed with rezoning you guys if I did apply a permit to do high, high density residential I was under the impression that due to a septic and wastewater system that the town currently has is would not be able to handle such things we, yeah, you'd, we'd have to have a wastewater assessment done yeah. to determine whether or not it could handle that additional flow. But it wouldn't be an automatic yes. It would be something that would have to be assessed, yeah. So I guess... Okay. okay. No, uh, Councilor Tanner, a question for Connor, actually. Okay, yep. I guess you're <laughs> off the hook. <laughs> okay. Thank you. Yeah. So, Connor, in this particular case, uh, gentleman would apply for a uh, development agreement go through the development agreement process if they were to take occupancy of that building and start operating as uh, home services repair yeah. what what occurs during a development agreement like uh, there's legally I guess is what I'm asking uh, do you know what I mean yes yeah like in, the, in the meantime <laughs> what what could they do with that property essentially yeah honestly uh, that's a that's a tough one. I guess you could continue the permitted use of automotive repair or, uh, and sales. But um, that's, yeah, but yeah, to be clear, course. that's not what he wants no, to do. No, of course, yeah. Um, just so you may be able to speak better <laughs> to this, but I... So, I I'm yeah, so to be clear, he starts the development agreement process, Yeah. And, but obviously not using it as auto repair, he's using exactly, it as... Yeah. Yeah. What, yeah, go ahead. Yeah, so technically he would not be able to get a mm. permit uh, to operate the his current the business he wants to move in there until the DA is in place. Right. Yeah. But what if he did continue to operate or start operating as the proposed business while the DA is? What happens? Legally? So then that would be a violation. Yeah. Yeah. And then so that, that would have to come to council for um, options on recourse. So typically it's, it's um, a good court and you can either fine or you can have the business uh, judge order the business cease so that'd be council's decision to make okay. about, about <coughs> what remedy they wanted to pursue in court but it's it's either monetary penalty or it's an order to cease okay. yeah. and typically to start a violation a letter would be sent with a certain yeah. number of days to right. comply so yeah. there's that would be happening while <coughs> going through the development agreement process okay. that yeah, and and it, the development agreement process could only be entertained if this property wasn't Rezoned yes. to residential can only be entertained if it remains special commercial. Yeah. Right. So right, right, in the high right. density, yeah. there's no option for the, yeah. the type yes. of business. Understood. Yeah. 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 Really any commercial. Any other questions from council for myself? Uh, just hang tight. I think yeah, we're going to see if there's any other members of the public that wish to speak. Yeah. Um, this gentleman in the 
Second row there, sorry. And then at the back and then at the front. <laughs> Hi, Council. Um, my name's David Vermont, Mayor. Uh, I live at 87 Aberdeen Road and uh, I own 58 Elm Street and uh, I've owned it for many years. Um, I've operated it as it was always operated, um, as a, a barn and, and a blacksmith shop. That's all it's ever been used for, for 150 years. Um, and hearing what you're talking about with the wastewater and things like that, uh, I have a bunch of questions regarding what my options would be because I also, um, my parents are both now um, hospitalized with 24-hour care, so they're no longer uh, operating their estate, which includes 87 Aberdeen, 26 Elm Street, 54 Elm Street, another property on Aberdeen Road, <coughs> and um, another property on Elm Street, 54 Elm Street. And the two properties, 58 and 54, are adjoined. And so the question then becomes, uh, the only possible development that would happen there would be high density residential of some sort. It's approximately five acres of land right in the center of town. Um, and so I don't know if the, the wastewater and the storm sewers are up to a high density development there. Um, barring that, um, I would continue to operate it as a blacksmith shop um, and hopefully pass it down. Um, it's a very large building um, and so the other options within C8 could be really advantageous for me. There's a, a 30 by 40 loft with 20 foot ceilings in the top of it. Um, which would be useful for any number of secondary uses like a yoga studio. It's been used as a boxing ring. Um, it's been used uh, as storage. It's been used as a carpentry shop. So there's been, I've done many different things in that building over the years and it was never an issue in the past. We just did what we did. Um, and, uh, so the new zoning regulations sound very restrictive compared to any way it's ever been run before uh, and uh, I'm sort of in limbo as to then what my development options would be after that um, so it's it's not just the one thing it's it's juggling uh, more than one property as well uh, the other thing that comes up, which was your first presentation, was that you were looking at making an amendment so that uh, the C3 zoning could be broken so it could have 24 and a half foot uh, instead of that. And I saw the rest of the zonings require a uh, 66 foot wide for all the high density. And 54 Elm Street, which is a little more than four acres, only has the 49 foot frontage unless I sell my shop to go with it or portion some of that off. So <laughs> there's a whole bunch of co-joined things there. Um, and so some sort of, at some point some sort of development agreement's probably going to have to happen there to accommodate um, the use of that land. And there's also adjoining properties all the way around the backside of 54 Elm Street. Um, all the properties on the backside of Aberdeen and up on north um, that would be one way in um, and there's been various people that have approached me over the years very recently the phone still rings people are trying to buy that and develop it um, it's you know the, the total land that's landlocked there is probably 10 12 acres something like that um, so uh, I'm you know I'm open to various things but you know it was always my plan to just run that shop as a blacksmith shop, um, and I never really had any uh, other considerations. So um, there's all these things that have popped up, and I'm uh, uh, not a not a uh, not the kind of person to uh, be able to speak to all the 
bureaucratic side things and the building zones and all that kind of stuff. So that's where I'm at and that's what I'm trying to, uh, I just wanted to keep going the way I was going. The other thing is, is it was mentioned uh, that uh, council or that uh, the town department, planning department reached out to me uh, and I didn't respond. Well, that's not true. Uh, I talked to Mike Kahn, who was your building planner two last year, a number of times. I've got his phone number here, um, and he told me verbally that at that point you guys were planning on rezoning everything, and uh, that was dropped. He told me verbally that I had nothing to worry about, that uh, it had been reconsidered, and I didn't have to think about it again. Mike is no longer. He, he's been gone over a year, yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah. Uh, I can give you his phone number. <laughs> <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> it's probably now Connor's phone number. <laughs> <laughs> yes. um, in terms of your 58 Elm Street, it, I think the proposed zone is two, two unit residential, so not, not high density, but two unit residential for 58. Yeah, I understand yeah. that, but the thing is, is that uh, the rest of the property isn't going to be re isn't going to be redeveloped. Right. Um, as it stands right now. Um, and I'll, I'll hold a grudge, <laughs> and, I'll, and I'll hold that I'll hold that 12 acres um, landlocked forever. Yeah. No, no, I just wanted to because you you had I think you had said you thought it was going to be rezoned high high density residential. Well, the, the so. piece behind me is, and mm -hmm. and so that there if if I can't run it as a blacksmith shop and if I can't develop it, um, then. What are my options as a landowner, or, you know, as a property owner? I'm in the same thing. Can I apply for uh, having it made as high density residential? I think my property is probably larger than these guys, but theirs was already zoned uh, high density residential. Um, so why am I only being uh, considered as C2 or uh, R2 um, when? Other people are getting uh, high density residential just mm -hmm. thrown at them. So I mean, it seems like you know I'm 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 going to be I'm going to get all the the restrictions um, with none of the real benefits. I mean, I've got an acre of land there, um, and so am, that if I can't have um, the blacksmith shop and I re want to redevelop it again, is this water and septic there for me to put in? whatever the maximum density housing, which I think would be two, four units or something. I don't know what it is for. Uh, come on down. <coughs> so through in the R2 zone, the maximum number of homes would be two homes, I believe. Uh, I did have the previously the uh, chart up there. But um, yeah, the, uh, the, the property was not uh, conducive to a high density residential development as Elm Street is a substandard street and we don't believe that there is capacity on Elm Street currently uh, nor are the, the standards of the street wide enough uh, for a high density development really to take place on that property. Okay. So it's a different street than Dominion, right? Dominion and, and where the property is in Dominion is very There's different. There's 50 units right next to me. Mm -hmm. But not very already. Yeah, yeah. that was a, a previous development at, with previous zoning standards. Um, the, I understand there you, you do have other properties in the high density zone mm -hmm. uh, and those could be consolidated in the future uh, as part of a larger property, um, but currently we're just looking at 58 Elm Street. Yeah, it's uh, different okay. land. Yeah, I'm, I'm going from the, the zoning map that I have, which shows the entire area as zoned as... as yeah, uh, for this we're only dealing with, with, the, with 58. The zoning map I have shows that the entire area was... I mean, it's, it's out of date, obviously, the zoning map I'm going from, but um, I don't have a, a current one. But that was my understanding, so I mean... So that may be, it, 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 it's a different process. So we're looking at the rezoning of the C8 oh, the properties only, of which, of which 58 Elm Street is one of those properties being rezoned. You have other parcels that you're referencing or other areas of land around there that are zoned differently. 
Um, um, and if you want to look at those, it's, that's not part of this amendment process. Uh, my, my understanding was that the the town, the, the planning uh, papers or whatever, um, had that whole area marked for development eventually as high density residential. That's on the town maps that I have, the zoning maps that I have. They're out of date, obviously, but. Um, yeah, yeah and, and I think staff could, it, uh, they're not part of this amendment process so staff can certainly sit down with you and kind of yeah. go over those parcels what they're zoned and what your options are if you want to change the zoning or um, how it can be developed the way it's zoned now yeah. they, they can get you up to date on that yeah well I mean I mean I, I think I've said my piece as far as that goes um, and I certainly understand your concerns 58 Elm Street in terms of the blacksmith shop I yeah, think, I, and, and I really want to keep it the way it is. Yeah, and you, you had submitted a letter before our first reading, I believe, uh, stating that as well. So and that, I spoke that was to Mike Khan last yeah. year um, when the process started, and I was reassured that, that the, the, the planning was being dropped at that time. Uh, yeah. So I was caught off guard by um, this. So anyway, I'm taking up a lot of your time. No, I, I, know you I appreciate you stepping that's, that's forward. <laughs> Yeah. yeah. Okay. Great. Thank, Thank you. you. Thanks. Uh, the gentleman at the back, I think, is first. And then the, yep. Come on down. Just state your name, please. My name is Andrew Collicutt. Uh, I'm from Naughty Pearl Street. Uh, I'm the car dealer up there. Also known as the guy in the hill and maybe other things that I don't want to know about. But <laughs> anyway, so here's my here's my uh, presentation. Um, Going to make it short. I do not want my C8 designation changed to R3. Talking specifically about my business at Naughty Pearl Street, um, it has continued non-interrupted for decades. It survived changes in the town. COVID and a major development on the street simultaneously. It's not much of a street. Well, it wasn't much of a street before the back end was paved. Now it's a better street. Anyway, um, C8 works for me and uh, my family as our vision for the near future. Uh, when the town established the C8 designation for us, Pearl Street was a sleepy residential neighborhood, and it still is. Uh, my business is so low impact and innocuous that most residents of the town don't even know it's there. But it works for us. R3 zoning does not protect the life I've worked for in that if my family decided to spend over a year traveling the world or just doing something in this stage of our life, it's the later stage of our life, the business would be deemed to be discontinued. Uh, it's kind of an insult to someone who spent their whole life working in any business for themselves. And sickness is another matter and should be taken into account as COVID's not that far out of our rearview mirror. Uh, people in industry and government jobs can take one-year sabbaticals or sick leaves, uh, get paid, and return to a job when done. Uh, so, you know, we got to understand. Are we to understand that in this country, founded on the work of the individual, that those in Bridgewater's private sector are not afforded that same privilege? My C8 designation is required to protect my rights as a small business owner operator in case of a business disruption caused by circumstances either from within or without of said business. And the events of the past five years have proven this to be true. An R3 designation is the equivalent of working away with a guillotine hanging over my head. Our town is supposed to support and promote diversity. This policy should extend to my business as it currently exists. At present, we are not looking to develop the site into housing or anything else, uh, which by the way would be, anything else would be a strain on the water situation on the west side. Uh, there's no impact to adjoining property owners in my case because 
my C8 plot is completely surrounded by my own land. Uh, got a little blurb here. This, I'll just say this thing has been kicked around for a long time, like over a decade. It's come, it's gone. I, I don't know why. Like, and here's the reason, or a part of it. In a November 2020 amendments to special commercial uh, statement, they said the C8 zone, the, the, the CDD asserts that uh, the intent of the policy is to actually get rid of the, pers the commercial uses in this zone and transition it to residential. But I don't think that's the spirit or intent with the creation of the C8 zone. Instead, the C8 zone was meant to quantify small, pre-existing commercial operations outside the downtown core uh, that were in residentially zoned areas. Thus identified, the town could pick up some commercial tax dollars on the operators while regulating their growth or decline. And here's the thing, it's elegant in its simplicity because once the property ceases to be used for the purpose through sale, discontinuation or death, the council gets to rezone. So I do respect the intent of the future land use map and I do respect planning developments uh, and the planning department because towns have to be forward-looking, especially this town. It's growing fast. Uh, the proposed new C9 highway commercial zone, which was birthed in uh, uh, 2022 as an example. However, that doesn't mean that the older C8 zone is useless. At some point, there has to be a natural end to everything and a lot of these C8s, we're seeing that play out. As I pointed out to planners over the years, C8 may be a seldom used tool in the box, but it still works. Thank you. Thank you. Questions? <laughs> so for, for Connor again, sorry. <laughs> so, so do we make allowances or have we made allowances if the business ceases due to illness, due to sabbatical temporary sabbatical, I don't know, whatever, yeah. So I think the case with the C8 zone is a little different than moving these businesses over to a non-conforming use as that's a very strict one-year timeline, whereas we are just rezoning the C8 properties that have discontinued in this process. So the uh, eight properties I first mentioned that had no existing commercial uses, this is their time to be rezoned. Right. And right. they have been discontinued for quite some time at this okay. point. So it, I mean, it maybe should have been spurred earlier for some of those properties, um, but this is the process that has taken those properties out of the CA zone. Other questions? Okay, perfect, thank you. Thank you. And then I think this, this gentleman in the front, did you? Uh, I'm not a public speaker like my son. Uh, my name is Kyle, uh, Roland. He's Kyle. <laughs> anyway, uh, what was interesting, I, I'm just, I wish I would have done more research before I came here. But like uh, you're, you're cherry picking C8 business, uh, commercial businesses. And it's just, it's really odd that you would choose. Now, if the curling rink were to stop tomorrow, would that be rezoned in R2 or 3 or something? Or the fire department or the legion? I mean, there's all kinds of businesses around. And your, your big map I saw initially, it was almost the entire town, both sides of the river, wasn't it? There are seats yeah. on both sides of the river. Yes. Yeah. 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 But like I say, it, it, but to me, it's just odd that, well, uh, <coughs> Kyle bought this property, it, it settled in June, June 28th or something. And then we find out that it may be discontinued as a business. Like, I, you know, I don't know, was there any preamble? Was that should have been not allowed to be bought as a, a business? Or I, I, there would have been communication probably to the previous owner 
as we went through this process. So all, all the landowners yeah. were notified. Okay. They were all consulted and so, contacted. Yeah, so they should have told <coughs> Kyle them. I where, where, who, where was the onus <coughs> at that point? There was no, I think, I believe this property might have been caught between first and second reading, right? Is that right? Just before first reading. Just before first reading. But so, we would have sent notice yeah. to. So there wouldn't have been any um, public been notice at that point except for the, the contact that you would have had with property owners to say that it's going to go forward and, right. and council wanted to ensure that they had, you know, were consulted through that process. But the previous property owner would have been aware. All the owners were contacted. Yeah. So yeah. the previous property owner but knew, and okay. whether it's a requirement but for disclosure when you purchase property is beyond my my uh, ability to answer. Yeah. And this this yeah. bill hasn't been passed yet, but you're still working on it. This it is it, not passed. Yet, no, right. it needs to go through second <coughs> reading to be passed. Yeah, okay. and that'd be tonight if council deemed advisable. Yeah. Okay. Anyway, well, good luck. I don't know. It's like, <laughs> I, I don't. I, I I'm just dumbfounded that you can and cherry pick the. The type of business it has to remain as. Like, I would not want a, an automobile uh, repair shop, you know, right, right there. It, you know. Anyway, uh, good luck. Thank you very much. No, appreciate you speaking. Um, just so I, I mean, I, I think your question is very valid. See, it does seem like we're cherry picking. You, I think the goal is that you have you have some commercial operations in predominantly residential neighborhoods. And so the, the, the goal was fine to continue, but when they ceased, it would then become residential because it's, in, again, in a residential neighborhood. Um, so I, I do understand um, where staff were, were going with that. So it's not, it's not kind of trying to pick and choose um, just a set of businesses. Where it gets, I guess, certainly for me, where I'm struggling is it's commercial now you have someone who bought it who wants to keep it commercial um, I'm struggling with like you are caught the timing of yeah. the purchase for you has absolutely put you in the middle yeah. of because I don't think you owned it when we did first reading and you own it when we did second reading so I, I feel for you in this so my question to you is if I buy another commercial property, would that be, you just said it would be rezoned to residential? We're only talking about the C8. So just there's, the C8. Oh, there's yeah. only, Connor, do you know how many properties? Were? 14 in total. 14 in total in the whole town. Yeah. <laughs> so no, unless you bought another, yeah. unless you bought the gentleman's place on, Abra on Elm Street. <laughs> Yeah, no, it's only the C8 zone that we're that we're talking about. Um, I think that's everyone that's uh, public. Is there any questions for staff, Councilor Thorburn? Yeah, I have no problem with the eight commercial C8 businesses that have folded because they're not C8 anymore, mm -hmm. reverting. But I have a problem with the six mm -hmm. that are still commercial. And we're trying to rezone them, and what we're doing is putting a restriction on them, similar to what we had down on uh, King Street with a leather shop. Mm -hmm. And that took years, and very frustrating on the property owner to try and develop that. So I won't be supporting this motion. I'm sorry. We don't have a, we don't have a motion we're yet. We're still in the public yeah, hearing. We're yeah. still in the public hearing, but we'll, we'll yeah. come out yeah. of yeah. 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 that. And, um, but, I, but I hear what you're saying. Okay. Um, and to and to highlight kind of the issue here, we we have we've heard from from the folks here, and again, I appreciate it. it's never easy to come and stand before a council. Like I'm okay here, but I get nervous when I stand on that side. Um, so I appreciate you taking the time and and uh, speaking to council. But to Councilor Thorburn's point, um, a number of them here, like it's this is a great thing to do, and we've had a couple of people saying, yeah, please please change it because. It hasn't been commercial for a while, and we want it to be residential, and it should be zoned residential. Um, but tonight, we've heard for somewhere that that doesn't work. So I just want to give council another opportunity to ask staff questions. Then I'm going to uh, end the public hearing. Then we're going to go back into the council meeting where we can debate this and put a motion on the floor. Yeah. Deputy Mayor, for sure. Um, yeah, so um, to... 
just to add to Councillor Thorburn's comment, um, did staff look at what it would look like keeping those businesses that are currently in the C8 zone, those six of the 14, and keeping them and how that would um, how that would look from a zoning perspective? And I know you're trying to uh, look at look at the future of the whole planning map and yeah. land use um, just wondering if that was a consideration I guess yeah, yeah. So, so for for a number of these existing commercial uses staff did look at uh, different commercial zones that they may fit in uh, unfortunately a lot of these uses are so unique that they yeah. can fit in another commercial zone and additionally other commercial zones have the uh, I guess the the impact of uh, property setbacks from residential zones, mm -hmm. uh, whereas the C8 zone does not. Um, so even if th there were instances where uh, staff looked at rezoning to a commercial property, but it did have such an impact mm -hmm. on the property owner that the, the use would not be, the, the property would be basically rendered unusable um, because the setbacks brought the property to such a size that it, it was limited in what could be done for development. Um, so really the the impact of retaining the C8 zone would be uh, essentially none as they're already zoned the C8 zone and mm -hmm. they, those setbacks aren't in place there uh, there is the measures already in place to limit the the, uh, the expansion of those businesses so um, maintaining those C8 zone properties wouldn't be a, a change it would just be but um, is the goal to eliminate the C8 text amendment as well in the... So that would eventually, I, I guess that would come through as, if we were to retain some C8 zone properties, yeah. uh, the the C8 zone would still eventually be dis er, eliminated through the discontinuation of businesses in the future. Okay. So even if we were to retain a single business in the C8 zone, Mm -hmm. That would eventually, oh, well, unless it's a uh, uh, quite the business and lasts for so it a would long be grandfathered <laughs> out, I guess. <laughs> yeah, it's it's a little yeah. confusing going between the non-conforming and the, the C8 mm -hmm. in terms of the, the grandfather term. But okay, um, yeah, retaining the C8 uh, wouldn't necessarily impact the the future of, of development okay. uh, in a negative way. Councilman McDonald. I think I'm getting some things mixed together here yeah, too. I just want to make yeah. sure that I understand. The properties that um, are currently in the zone, but the commercial use has discontinued for some time. The zoning as it is right now, we could rezone them as residential because it call that, that zoning calls for it anyway. Correct? Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. And I have spoken okay. to those property owners, and they have not indicated any <coughs> desire to stay in the right, city. They're zone. fine with that. Yeah. So we don't, we wouldn't have to do anything to kind of move those over to residential, as is would do that. And then the commercial uses that wish to remain yes. could stay with those, that list of other uses that they could do by development agreement. So, yeah, the, that's some of the options I presented right. uh, on this slide. Yeah. Uh, so <laughs> there was a, a couple options there uh, to retain the existing businesses. Uh, within the C8 zone or any combination of those mm -hmm. businesses as there was a couple uh, business owners who uh, weren't opposing the rezoning necessarily but mm -hmm. uh, they weren't necessarily in favor of they did right. they saw the non-conforming uh, status as enough for their business for right. their future of their business um, and so they were okay with the rezoning and that's why I included that second option to any combination of the C8 zones right. retained Okay, and may I? Sorry. Yep. Okay. <laughs> and I just want to make sure I'm really, yeah, really clear. Of course. Uh, Mr. Walker's property, uh, if we change, if we we move over, we are really limiting his uses. Yes. He would not They're have any opportunity for his business should we rezone right. the property. And Curren currently even in the C8 zone, he does have okay. opportunity to apply for a development agreement. Right. For a household repair use, which would right. capture his okay. business use. Thank you. Yes. I think I think yeah, you've summarized enough for me now that I think I'm on the right page. <laughs> yeah. two, two questions or yeah, yeah, right. I'll, I'll, <laughs> yeah. Uh, so, so out of curiosity, what was your timeline for starting to open this or being open? Well, I'm running out of the house. 
was there now. <laughs> okay. 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 So an eight to twelve month <laughs> development agreement would hurt your business, so to speak. We stopped operating the house. Yeah. No. Okay. Uh, and for you, Connor, I guess on the Elm Street property. So if hypothetically, or maybe it is, all those other properties that are surrounding it or attached to it, so to speak, yeah. are high density. Yes. And, a, and there's a development agreement that occurs that says, okay, we want to put high, del, high yeah. density development in off of North Street, let's say, for all yeah. those properties. Um, that Elm Street yeah. piece uh, could be, a like development agreement could be defined to make it high density. Yep. Yeah. Because it's entrapped anyway, or I assume. Uh, so it does have it does have frontage mm -hmm. on Elm Street. Yeah. Um, there is another property uh, abutting in that, which there are two properties behind it which don't have street frontage, yeah. and then another property which does have limited street frontage. Right. Uh, I've spoken to an individual who was interested in developing developing that property at one point, and there is opportunity to put a. I think it's a either a. Yeah, it's basically like a street into the property. Uh, which really takes away from the concern for the street frontage, the, the limited street frontage and the uh, substandard street on Elm Street. Okay. Um, but then there is opportunity to come in off north. But uh, again, there's, I think there's one, two, about six lots that would have to be consolidated to, to actually build a, a large development out of all those properties. Understood. Um, okay. It's just the, limit, the, the limited size of the 58 Elm is not conducive to a larger development, if it was considered, if it was consolidated with the rest of the properties, that may be a different. Story. Might be a different story. Yeah. Okay. Perfect. That answers okay. it. Yep. Okay. Um, if there's no further questions right this second. Don't go too far. We're gonna, we might, I'm going to. Um, I'm going to close the public hearing, and we will return to our council meeting where we can continue to to debate this. Um, although I, I I sense it can where we're going. Um, based on the, the feedback from the folks that came out tonight and staff report, which basically says they do have some people that are ready to um, to see the zoning change. And so you do have on your screen, you can see a number of um, options. And option two is, is one that uh, would defer the request back to staff to retain the C8 zone and maintaining those six properties within the existing commercial uses with said zone while rezoning those remaining properties which have discontinued their commercial uses. This would entail uh, returning to first consideration. So just for the public's uh, information, we're at second consideration and we were gonna go, we'll go back to, should probably walk away from the microphone, go back to first consideration. Um, but um, it should say like, um, Dominion, was Dominion Street would need to be updated. Yeah, so we'd have to yeah. update that to, to uh, reflect Mater's, the uh, the current the, the, um, your new use, or that it's, there's a change there, right? Yeah. Um, and I got a feel for you because you're kind of between the first and second, and mm -hmm. this would have been one heck of a surprise to. Yeah. To, um, okay. So that is one of the options. Um, Obviously, that's at the will of council, so I don't know if someone has any other questions. Councilor Caldwell? We are out of the special meeting now. We are. Correct? Yes, we are. We are <laughs> back to regular council. Yeah. Just a procedural matter. Yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah, so the, um, the property owners uh, eloquently describe their issues with this, um, with the proposed changes, and they've convinced me that, that it is problematic and i am i would be fully in favor of option two we go back to first consideration and um we remove some of the properties from the c8 zone but the the ones that have existing businesses should should remain that's what i believe would you like to make that motion we can we can debate that is there yeah sure um number two is number two read number, number two just as is uh, number two, add, number two uh, yeah. and and I think that when staff brings it back for first consideration, we'll update the list oh, okay. of yeah. uses to make sure it okay. reflects current. Yeah, yeah. So we, uh, yeah as is, is good. Yeah. Thank you. I move the council defers the request back to staff to retain the special commercial C8 zone and maintain the six properties with existing commercial uses within said zone while rezoning those remaining properties which have discontinued the commercial uses. This would entail returning to first consideration. Mm -hmm. Second. 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 
Um, uh, but I'm still a little unclear because the C8 zone would still require a development agreement for this gentleman. We're updating it to reflect current uses. Current? Oh, okay. Okay. <laughs> oh, I see. Yeah, sure. <laughs> yeah. It's clever. Right. It's a good thing. Perfect. It's a good thing it came tonight. <laughs> boy, oh boy, oh boy. All right. You kick him from all the way over here. Wow. <laughs> okay. But thank you for pointing that out for clarity. That's good. No, that's very good. Well. <laughs> <laughs> I just want to make sure we weren't. No, that's great. Creating some trouble. Um, okay. So, and, and I do want to say before we have any further discussion, you know, I staff put a lot of work in this. I really appreciate the work. So I hope you're not kind of taking this away as what happened. Like this is this is why we do what we do. This is this is exactly what this is supposed to be. Staff do some research. The public comes out and says, I like this. But I don't like that. Council listens and says, okay, we heard this, we heard that, we're balancing both. Let's go back, take another look, and find that balance. That to me, that is exactly what well, pick an order of government. That's what orders of government are supposed to do. But I think that's that's effective council. I, I got a little during the staff was extremely helpful, courteous, and professional. Appreciate that. Thank you. And I know a lot of a lot of hours went into this. And uh, but again, this is exactly what's supposed to happen. So you know, tip it hat to you, Connor, and all of our community development staff that put the effort into this. So that's why we do it. Okay. So we have a mover. We have a yep. seconder. Uh, are there any more questions or comments from council? No. Question. Questions being called. All those in favor? Those opposed? Motion is carried. Now we know why Councilor Conklin didn't come to me. <laughs> no, I'm kidding. No. Um, <laughs> perfect. Thank you. Thanks for thanks for staying and thanks for um, coming out and expressing yourselves. And again, thank you to staff. Okay. Now I got to scroll through this agenda and figure out where I am. Uh, are we on 7.3? Notice of a policy amendment uh, yeah. for um, policy 1112, closure of public streets, Logan Road. All right. Um, <laughs> So this would just be giving notice that at the next council meeting, um, council would, will be considering amendments to that policy uh, regarding closure of public streets, and it's really a housekeeping um, measure to make sure that the road description is accurate. Um, and so notice tonight and next meeting you'll get into the details. Every time I see a notice and then the date of the next meeting, I could just I could just picture the clock. Like, <laughs> Make this meeting shorter, next one longer. Um, yeah, so <laughs> any questions for staff? Can I have a motion, please? Uh, Councilor Tanner, thank you. I move the town council for the town of Bridgewater give notice pursuant to Section 48 of the Municipal Government Act that at this September 9, 2024 council meeting, council will consider amendments to policy 112, closure of public streets, with respect to a portion of Logan Road as presented in Appendix A of document 23017C. Thank you. Seconded by. Councilor McDonald. Uh, all those in favor? Those opposed? Motion is carried. Thank you. Our next one is another notice, Amendment of Policy 67, Agreement for Provision of Services to Municipality of District of Lunenburg for 54 Riverview Drive. So this, this, uh, this request requires that we enter into an agreement uh, with a property owner to allow a second building on the lot to be connected to the town's wastewater system, and prop building happens to be within the District of Lunenburg. So the changes are really to reflect the updated um, sewer rate. Um, so it'd be the full rate for our charge for a connection and to ensure that we capture the wastewater betterment charge as well on that. So we're required to update the Schedule B in order to enable that. So that would be noticed that at the next meeting you would debate that and um, if deemed advisable, approve. Okay, any questions on that? Someone would like to make a motion. Councilor Darwin, thank you. I would move that Town Council of the Town of Bridgewater give notice pursuant to Section 48 of the Municipal Government Act that at the September 9th, 2024 Council meeting, Council will consider and, if deemed advisable, approve amendments to Policy 67, Sanitary service, Sewer Service with respect to provisions of sanitary sewer service to outside of the town boundary, but within the bounds of 54 Riverview Drive and to direct staff to execute the sanitary sewer service policy schedule B 
agreement based on an additional sewer service charge of $673 per annum and the wastewater betterment charge of $1,500 in document number 24-134. Thank you. Seconded by everyone on this side. <laughs> Some people on this side. Oh, no, sorry, Councilor Caldwell. <laughs> All those in favor? All opposed? Motion is carried. Yeah, try to make it light. <laughs> um, we're down to correspondence for information. We have a letter from um, the Minister of Municipal Affairs and Housing, Minister Lore, um, regarding a 10 year agreement um, of funding with the federal government. Mm -hmm. So that's just basically to outline that there will be a predictable stream of funding for municipal yep. units for the next 10 years. Yep. And I think they, in their correspondence, they they do indicate that there will be a certain amount that will be within the first five years, okay. 318 million to municipalities That's for infrastructure. Good. That's good. I noticed that they also note that it will be for the, you know, we need housing, so that's mm -hmm. good. So we just talked about needing infrastructure money for housing, so that's helpful. Any questions on that? Uh, we are down to staff reports and recommendations. So 24117B, which is a uh, property the property tax exemption status for 629. Okay. Okay. So at the uh, July 8th council meeting, um, the council had some discussion with respects to uh, the the property 629 King Street, where the John Howard Society is located. Um, in, in, in reference to its placement on our property tax exemption bylaws. So Council had, um, in September of 2023, amended the property uh, tax exemption bylaw to provide for a full tax exemption from property taxes for 629 King based on the use proposed. Um, it has a value of around 12500 That was the 2023 um, amount that would have been payable. The application at the time was for a ground floor office, two three-bedroom residential units <coughs> on the second story, and one five-bedroom unit on the third, and a barrier-free drop-in center with wraparound supports. Um, since the, the uh, occupation of that property for that use, um, there has been a, a notable impact on um, the services that the town provides, in particular some additional police supports required. Um, which of course are paid for by the tap by the property tax owner, which is um, why council was questioning whether or not its placement was still warranted on the tax sale list, since it's costing a little bit more to support that that use than anticipated. So that sent ta staff on a uh, with some direction to look at can we um, reconsider that and and have that removed from the tax sale list, given its impact on the cost of our services. Uh, the speaking with legal counsel and doing a, a little bit of research, the property tax exemption bylaw would not enable the removal unless something changed. So the use is as was proposed, that, that hasn't changed, uh, and the ownership hasn't changed either. So sometimes the use will cease, the ownership will change, um, they may not be non-profit uh, anymore, um, and those would warrant review. But having said that, um, the bylaw further provides that every three years, council reconsider or consider the continuance of a property on that list. So you have a number of properties that are on your property tax exemption bylaw now. We have the food bank, South Shore Field House, and John Howard Society that are at full tax exemption, and then you have partial tax exemptions which go basically from commercial to residential. So instead of paying the commercial rate, they pay the residential rate, and we have the Bridgewater Masonic Society, the ARC, and the Curling Club. And your bylaw says that you will review that every three years. So Council may, you know, at, in light of this experience, but also with, in good practice, may wish to look at revising your bylaw <coughs> to require the review of that list on an annual basis. And that's to ensure, again, that nonprofit uh, status still remains, that it's still providing a use so it, it triggers all those reviews to make sure that it still meets the criteria and is still warranted to be on, on the list. And that way um, you're not deal waiting three years to deal with that. Um, you, you're able to, to review it on an annual basis and ensure, ensure as I in indicated, that it would warrant continuing on that list. 
So that, that is an option, but in this particular case, the, the bylaw at this point does not enable um, removal if something hasn't changed. But for good practice, you may wish to, or best practice, you may wish to look at revising your bylaw to have that annual review, which is, is healthy to do just to make sure that we're not keeping things on the list longer than they should be. I just want to confirm if, if we were to change the frequency of the review, so basically it's a, a one year mm -hmm. approval, um, properties, or sorry, organizations who have already received a three year approval, mm -hmm. would they be affected by that change? They would be required to submit to us the annual, the annual pieces of that to make sure that nothing's changed. So we would go back to them and tell them your three years is no longer three years, it's you know, whatever yeah, it was. That's the intent, yeah. 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 Okay. Yeah. I just wasn't sure if we could do that because we couldn't with the sidewalk patio bylaw, things like that. So I just wanted to make sure that we can go back and change what we've already mm -hmm. approved. Yeah. If conditions or criteria change, uh, we would, of course, get legal counsel to make sure that, that okay. that's the case. But, yeah, if nothing's okay. changed on it and you're changing that, you would want to have, um, we would require them to submit all that stuff on an annual basis going forward. Other questions on that? I mean, to me, it highlights the need to do it on a little bit of a shorter time frame because, yeah, um, yeah. there's a whole bunch of reasons. <laughs> Is someone prepared to make a motion? Councilor Caldwell, thank you. I move the town council for the town of Bridgewater direct staff to bring forth a report and amendments to the property tax exemption bylaw that would necessitate an annual review of properties exempt from the property tax to ensure that placement on the tax exemption list remains warranted. Thank you. Seconded by Council McDonald for the discussion. Hearing none, all those in favor? Those opposed? <coughs> motion is carried. We are down to CAO updates, strategic priorities, and Q1 reports. Well. <laughs> So this is the uh, priority update for Q1, which would go from April till the end of June. You have attached to this report the quarterly reports for all the departmental activities that drill down a little bit more in detail with respect to the priorities. Uh, some of the key things uh, with respect to your priorities over the last quarter, uh, we've been focusing on exit 12A, and Council's had um, some workshops with staff uh, looking at how you wish to see um, conceptually exit 12A uh, develop, and that'll help inform a marketing plan. Uh, the development and infrastructure charges, which is another key piece of looking at exit 12A, but other areas in town, uh, we are almost done. I think I have 80% by that for, for that RFP. With the target, we're a little bit um, longer than we wanted to be in terms of getting it out, so we'll have that out in the second quarter. Um, the museum rebranding, the transition plan, uh, we will have that presented to you in this quarter, second quarter, but uh, a good part of that was completed in Q1. Uh, regional building inspection was completed uh, in terms of the service agreement with Council. So that was targeted to be completed at the end of 23-24, but we completed it in the last quarter. So that has been signed, and implementation is proposed for September on that. And then the uh, clean fuel feasibility and opportunity assessment piece is, is actively underway and Don has been working with our consultants and stakeholders on that over the last quarter. Um, the condition assessment for our facilities was also completed last quarter uh, in terms of coming up with the priority list and looking at a, a plan for that. So we'll move that into our capital budget going forward. And the privacy officer, we started recruiting for that and Q1, and we hope we hope to have that uh, complete in Q2. So, a little, a little few recruitment challenges with that position itself. Um, in terms of the strategic priorities chart, uh, there were some changes that have been made to that over the last um, quarter, based on discussions with council. So you can see, we took out the regional building inspection service. It's no longer a policy piece. It's going into implementation. Um, we added decentralized wastewater options. So the council wanted to, to staff to take a look at that and bring back some amendments. Um, and we took out facility plan, 
and we added in, I believe, year in audit. So you can kind of see how those got dispersed through the departments. And as I indicated, the rest of uh, the detail is um, a lot more of the things that you don't necessarily see on your strategic priority chart um, are noted in the departmental quarterly reports to council. And we have most of our management team here if anyone's got any questions. Perfect. Mm -hmm. okay. All right. Any questions of the CIO? Someone moved. Oh, sorry, Council Call. What's happening regarding uh, bylaw enforcement? So that one I have noted down that there hasn't been any time to devote to that. Um, and I think I have targeted the second quarter to bring a report to Council that would outline the bylaws that we have that need enforcement. Mm -hmm. um, and what options, you know, how they're being done now, and if we want to see an improved service level, um, which ones, and then we can explore the options. Okay. Other questions? Someone prepared to make a motion? Make a motion. Please. Yes, Thank Your Worship. You. I move that the town that town council for the town of Bridgewater accept the strategic priorities update departmental quarterly reports for the first quarter of the 2024-25 fiscal year as presented and further that town council approve the revisions to the strategic priorities chart as contained in document 24-135 perfect thank you seconded by councillor tanner all those in favor cross opposed motion is carried uh we have the building inspection reports for june and july so here we are in another record year um staff are just flat out um town is booming so um if you have any questions please connect to the cao the staff about those we also have uh, as always the um Lindenburg county senior safety uh monthly report for july and just it's the same uh, ask as last month um, they have a special request for used iphones um, so used iphones are repaired and other working cell phones android or flip phones are distributed to seniors and others in need to keep them connected to essential service providers, health care and emergency services. For isolated older adults, this can be extremely important. So if you have a cell phone that's not being used, please consider <coughs> donating it either to the Lunenburg County United Way or to the Lunenburg County uh, Seniors Safety Program uh, for redistribution. So that's, um, that's a big need for them. So, and then um, as always, just a reminder to the public that every piece of paper that we're looking at uh, is available online on the town's website under council and agendas and the whole agenda is there so we don't have any anything extra that we're dealing with uh, on this agenda it's all there for everyone to to read including that that uh, request from um, senior safety so we're down to another notice for policy amendment uh, re policy 89 for fees mm. so this is just to update some of the engineering fees to reflect more the actual cost um, as opposed to uh, I think the, the fees were kind of outdated it didn't reflect necessarily how much it cost to deliver that so some curb cut fee changes and those types of things so they'll come forward for consideration at the next meeting okay. so we're prepared to make that motion we'll put it on the agenda for September 9th Deputy Mayor for Jira. Uh, yes, Your Worship. I move that Town Council for the Town of Bridgewater give notice pursuant to Section 48 of the Municipal Government Act that at the September 9th, 2024 Council meeting, amendments to Policy 89 fees with respect to ensure the fee structure for work per performed by the Engineering Department are set properly as outlined in doc Document 24-140. Thank you. Seconded by Councilor McDonald. All those in favor? Those opposed, motion is carried. So that'll be on the next agenda. Now we're down to our temporary boring resolution. Um, yep. So this is uh, required to um, help fund uh, capital projects that have been completed, capital carry forwards, as well as the 2425 capital. So uh, Kim is a little early on this, and it's it's primarily because of elections and perhaps a delay in council meetings after the election. So the amount of the board resolution is seven million three hundred thirty nine thousand six hundred fifty two, and the agenda does contain a table that outlines what those capital items are. And as I say, for the um, in this year's capital, it's the wastewater treatment plan, 
storm separation St. Philip Street project. We have carry forwards for the wastewater treatment plant, flare stack and pine crest subdivision storm sewer. Um, and then there's 600 in other carry forwards to do with the museum, BMA, the condition assessment on the wastewater treatment plant and backhoe, and a, not condition assessment on backhoe, but an actual backhoe. And then we have the Dufferin Street upgrades, High Street upgrades, pump station 11 design and replacement, and a five ton trunk. And then some miscellaneous equipment as well. So that's all items that were approved in your capital budget as carry forwards or in this year. And um, so everything's in order for the TBR if council wishes to approve. Any questions on temporary board resolution? Again, they were all in our budget. Someone prepared to make that motion. Council Call, thank you. Move the town council for the town of Bridgewater approve the temporary borrowing resolution in the amount of seven million three hundred thirty nine thousand six hundred fifty two dollars for the purposes presented in document twenty four dash one four one. Seconded by Councilor Tanner. Further <coughs> discussion. Hearing none. All those in favor? Those opposed. The motion is carried. Now we're down. Like I know that Matt has been just so. Like waiting for this. It's like, when is it my time to shine? And now is your time. Sidewalk improvement program and cost share agreement for Veterans Bridge. And all kidding aside, there are people, I know there's people watching council right now that are going to be super excited by this. Oh yeah. <laughs> okay to move that. All right. I'm excited by this. <laughs> okay. So yes, uh, the mo this memo uh, that you're uh, here tonight to talk, I guess, about sidewalks, uh, two separate issues. Uh, the sidewalk along the Veterans Memorial Bridge uh, is one project in our capital budget uh, for $50,000 in HST. Uh, and then we all have our annual sidewalk improvement program uh, that is $90,000 uh, $90, each year uh, for various improvements throughout town, which is subject to an annual assessment that staff do uh, each spring. Um, so, just a little bit of background, the, the Veterans Memorial Bridge um, uh, itself, the sidewalks, the posts and rails is covered by a bridge maintenance agreement with Nova Scotia Department of Public Works and really um, I believe it is attached now um, and it basically points out that under section 1.3 the town is responsible for maintaining the bridge riding surface and the sidewalks um, and the cost to maintain will be equally cost shared. Uh, so at the time of preparing the budget, uh, myself, uh, we plan to complete the repairs in-house uh, on the bridge. Uh, subject to the annual side sidewalk assessment that we did there in May, found out really the level of effort required on that bridge uh, was significantly more than what the staff anticipated in the fall, <coughs> and therefore we, uh, due to the level of deterioration, so really we want to step back from that, and uh, we have reached out to the department to, to seek advice on the matter. Meanwhile, uh, Public Works has done a phenomenal job uh, on a number, uh, a couple areas of sidewalk, specifically 175 meters of sidewalk along Star Street, which has been renewed, and 125 meters of curb and gutter and sidewalk along King Street. Um, the sidewalk assessment that was done in the spring said the next priority would be North Street, uh, specifically between Waterman's Lane, the private road, and the driveway uh, for the days in, which is about 110 meters. Um, so that's kind of the background with respect to uh, when, we, when we reached out to the Department of Transportation or Department of Public Works to seek advice on the Veterans Memorial Bridge, what they suggested was um, that we enter into cost share agreement for the bridge repairs um, because they're in the best position to oversee uh, that work. It would be a long-term solution where we would see the entire bridge repaved, uh, the approaches as well as the, any posts or sidewalk repairs done as well that those repairs would be done through cost shared. Um, I do note that the bridge expansion joints, which we do receive a number of complaints each year, will be full, would be repaired at the same time at 100% uh, by the province. When they made the suggestion, uh, Department of uh, Public Works did go complete a site visit. They came up with an estimate cost of 765,000 plus HST. Of that, 50% of that would be the town share of about uh, 382,000. 
Um, so this far exceeds what is in the budget. Uh, what staff have uh, allocated $50,000 to do the work in-house. So um, if staff, uh, uh, staff would recommend that if we are not to proceed with that uh, work this year, that we reallocate that to North Street. Um, that, and we could do that work uh, once paper management would be completed in uh, late September and the 50000 allocated for Veterans Bridge would be more than sufficient to cover uh, the repairs on North, understanding that we are on that section anyways to do a bus shelter installation. Um, should be noted that, um, you know, our, our, the good work by Public Works, um, looking at uh, the cost increases for material, concrete, and our con uh, contract services, traffic control, we did go over budget uh, by approximately $30,000 for the uh, Star Street and King Street. However, it should be noted that our operational budget, there's about $53,000 in there. Uh, we are only projected to spend about 20 to 25 of that. So um, the uh, savings in the operational uh, account should offset what we are over, uh, over exceeded or over expended in the capital. Um, also, I know that the previous discussions uh, with council on sidewalks, it's always good to note how we compare to the private sector. Um, so looking at the 20, 20 24, 25 unit prices, um, the estimated work for just King and Star would be in all over $152,000 net HST, so we've realized about $30,000 of savings by doing the work in-house. Um, kind of uh, building on top of that, because of the good work uh, that we've done to date, or Public Works has done to date, uh, staff, I know Council has asked each year as well, uh, can, do you need more money? Do you, uh, come your annual budget. So we are suggesting that at a bare minimum we probably look to increase our annual sidewalk budget to at least $150,000 to do more. That reflects more work but also the price increases. Of course subject to doing those staff assessments in likely later in the fall again and project takeoffs. In terms of the strategic priorities, um, just understand that the uh, Department of Transportation has said that they would like to do the work next year on the Veterans Memorial Bridge, which is in line with the work that staff are already scheduling for La Haven Aberdeen. So it does make sense to, lack of a better word here, get the paint all done at once mm -hmm. uh, for the uh, La Haven Aberdeen intersection as well as the Veterans Bridge. It also provides the ability for synergies uh, with traffic control, um, shutting one lane down having it while working on the one side while keeping movement on the other. Um, so, which is a very good thing, and the Department of Transportation feels that they will follow, they will follow the same schedule as us, which right now we are going out for design uh, with the RFP. Uh, we suspect the design will be done uh, by late February and tender it uh, by April, and work would start in May, and they would follow the same timeline. Um, and uh, if we don't proceed with the work, uh, I should note that if council would wish to continue with doing veterans uh, memorial sidewalk, veterans memorial sidewalks this year, um, it is really in the staff's plan to issue a tender, which would probably need to happen. So that work would wouldn't likely work out this year, anyways, um, because we the work plan was always to do it in house. So now I have to go out, out uh, to to go exterior or go external. Sorry. Which would mean the creation of a tender, working with the Department of Transportation to review the plan, um, and that would all have to be done this fall. And we would be worried that it would the sidewalk repairs wouldn't be done uh, in time before winter sets in. So, uh, unfortunately, it kind of painted itself in the corner. But at least we have a uh, a good opportunity to work together on um, with Department of Trans uh, Department of Public Works, and uh, on top of our the Have Aberdeen project next year. So staff would recommend for this uh, for this coming year as well as as, as next is that we uh, direct staff council direct staff to enter a cost share agreement with Nova Scotia Department of Public Works for the rehabilitation of the Veterans Bridge uh, at an estimated cost of to the town of three hundred ninety thousand plus HST uh, for the twenty five twenty six budget and to reallocate the funds for Veteran Memorial Bridge sidewalk repair of $50,000 in HST to the sidewalk repairs on North Street where the work would commence in the fall of this year. Any questions for Mr. Davis and Councilor Tanner? Matt, is there, <coughs> so my understanding is Public Works will issue the tender RFP for the sidewalk piece? Uh, Ultimate, no, yeah, Nova Scotia Department of Public Works for the Veterans Bridge, yes. Yeah. Is there any benefit of us issuing that as a bigger package including La Have Aberdeen? Or is it just not allowed? 
<coughs> what I can say is that uh, they, they suggested that they, they would do that. Yeah. Um, and I know that we've worked together um, on other projects, but normally the provinces has been the one to issue the tender for it in totality. So I'll use High Street and, and say they've issued it and then we, uh, we've completed the work. So it is something to look at, um, but what they've, what they've suggested is we do ours, they do, our, uh, they do theirs, and we just really communicate well uh, on the execution. Yeah, I, I was just thinking with typically one bidder, mm -hmm. would a bigger package be perceived better, I guess, and is there either we issued or maybe they could issue the whole mm -hmm. package on our behalf with some conditional piece for other. Anyway, just throw that out. At this point, we, we staff have begun the RFP process uh, for the La Have Aberdeen intersection design. Yeah. So uh, we could talk with them. Uh, I, I'm, uh, okay. Yeah, it's worth a question. It's, it's worth sure. an ask yeah, for sure. Okay. Yeah, I like the mm -hmm. idea of asking. Mm -hmm. so, if here. Yeah, that's great news. I'm glad to see this with the Veterans Bridge. Um, having see that it's not doable till next year, um, is there any concerns of? I know there are sections of the sidewalk that are in poor condition and worry about tripping hazard and so on. Do staff need to address that? Um, like I know there's broken pieces of concrete on the there, sidewalk. There's certainly, uh, you know, while well, I didn't cover every detail in the memo. Yeah. Um, but uh, there are there are a couple areas that staff would try to address as best as possible, uh, understanding that it won't uh, be it will be a very temporary solution yeah. until the work is done, uh, particularly on the corner of Aberdeen and La Have the north side mm -hmm. of that intersection where the, the future yep. two lane will be. Uh, we do need to try to do something better than what's there. Okay, just worried about yeah. that from a but pedestrian we're worried about walking. the other areas yeah. in, in terms of uh, doing any grading or, or concrete work. It, it won't stay as soon as the first plow right. gets on the uh, right. yeah. bridge. Okay. Good question. Other questions? Sorry, I'm looking at the Someone prepared to make a motion? Councilor McDonald, thank you. I would move the Town Council for the Town of Bridgewater to direct staff to enter into a cost share agreement with the Nova Scotia Department of Public Works for the rehabilitation of Veterans Bridge in 2025-2026 and hereby approve the town's share estimated to be approximately 390000 plus HST to be included in the 2025-26 budget. And do we do the second one at the same time? Yep. Okay. Uh, and reallocate the funds in the 2024-2025 budget for the Veterans Memorial Bridge Sidewalk Repair, $50,000, net HST to the sidewalk repairs on North Street. Perfect. Thank you. Seconded by Councilor Thorburn. Further discussion? Question. Question being called. All those in favor? Those opposed? Motion is carried. Thank you very much. Thank you. Now, people are going to wonder, what's this other work at La Have and Aberdeen you're going to be doing? <laughs> well, that's to uh, <laughs> increase the uh, right turn onto the bridge as we all queue up for what seems like three or four counties um, when it's busy, especially on a long weekend, um, changing that queue lane so that it was would be uh, more right turn space. That's huge, 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 so that's good. Um, down to item 10.8, deadline for amended list of electors for the 2024 municipal election. In the case the public hadn't noticed, there's a municipal election in every municipality across the province this fall. Mm -hmm. So the um, Municipal Elections Act requires that council set a deadline for the amended list of electors and that may be based on the recommendation of the returning officer. So Julie Vissers is our returning officer and uh, understanding that um, nomination paperwork can be filed by appointment starting August 29th with the official nomination day on September 10th. She's recommending that the amended list be completed by August 26. So that'll give her the ability to ensure that everything's all done and nicely wrapped up in time for the first appointment on the 29th. Perfect. Someone prepared to make that motion? Deputy Mayor Fragier. Uh, yes, Your Worship. I move that Town Council for the Town of Bridgewater approve the recommendation of the returning officer and set a deadline of August 26, 2024 for the completion of the amended list of electors and as per Section 38 of the Municipal Elections Act. Thank you. Seconded by Councillor Caldwell. All those in favor? Those opposed? Motion is carried. I should have done this in announcements. This Wednesday at 6 o'clock in Town Hall is a very important uh, session for those um, interested in running for municipal council. Um, 
there. It's uh, there's no charge for it. I think you have to pre-register though, right? Yeah. And so it's reaching up to Julie. Julie. Yep. Um, so you can call town hall or charging for it. Um, <laughs> no, we're charging you for it. Um, <laughs> anyway, it's uh, it would be very informative if if you're just kind of kicking around the idea and understanding um, that. Um, I've been asked to speak a few times in different municipalities about to potential candidates, and the one thing that keeps coming back to is um, understanding the order of government and what its responsibilities are. I've had a number of people who, for example, I'm just using this as an example, come with them. I'm so upset about the carbon tax, I'm going to run for council. That is the wrong order of government to run on a platform of. You can be against the carbon tax, but you should be running as an MP. Um, or if you're upset at the provincial direction on education or health care, that's provincial. So it's, I think this section will be good for those who perhaps are, are thinking, I want to get involved for this reason or that reason, especially if it's like one reason, that's the one reason you want to run. Understanding that you might be more frustrated <laughs> if you were on a council, and I don't mean just in Bridgewater, but you're on a council and then realize this is a federal issue and it's not <coughs> anything that we're going to be able to deal with. So anyway, um, I don't know how many other municipalities are putting on one of these sessions, but kudos to staff for, for organizing that and putting that on. And um, I know it's town specific, but yeah. if someone was thinking of running in another <coughs> municipality and just wanted some information, they could come to that, right? Oh, yeah. Okay. Yeah. 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 So, for a fee, <laughs> yeah, yeah. So uh, yeah. <laughs> just we'll charge fee. Then. We have to we have to pay uh, Andrew's large speaking fee. Yeah, yeah. Oh yeah. So, yeah. So I also appreciate giving up some of your time as a as a non returning counselor um, to share your experience and uh, those are your words, not mine. I think you said something about being sick of no, it was something else. <laughs> Again, now I know why why Councillor Conklin's not here. Um, but you can have fun when you run for council. Sure. Okay. Um, anyway, so that's important. Six o'clock town hall, open to anyone who's interested. But please pre-register mm -hmm. so that we can. So we know who to, how know, many to expect? Know, uh, who's coming? Um, yeah. Make sure we pick the right room. <laughs> yes. Okay. We are down to um, where are we? Ten point nine. It's uh, another temporary borrowing resolution for the public service commission, which of course are guaranteed by that town. Yeah. So this is a guarantee of that temporary borrowing resolution. It's. Uh, PSC has approved that and are, are forwarding it to, to council for, <coughs> for approval. And the amount to be borrowed is uh, $3,433,300. Um, and it's primarily to fund the uh, Empire Street Water Project at 2.5. And then there are some um, capital projects from 22, 23, and 23, 24 that had some debt financing which hasn't been financed yet or completed yet. So. That makes up the difference between the 3.4 and the 2.5. Um, there are some other projects that are um, proposed with uh, the Wild Brook Bridge and the Lime Silo that uh, we may come back with another temporary borrowing resolution guarantee at a future date. But these are the ones right now. And again, it's in anticipation that there will be delays and meetings uh, from the election to the swearing in of council. Couldn't have knocked a hundred grand off that, so it was a temporary borrowing resolution of three, 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 three. Three, three. No. That, that would have been. Blame it on Kim. That was <laughs> no, no chance. <laughs> uh, is there any questions on that? Someone prepared to make that motion. <laughs> Councilor Tanner. I move the town council for the town of Bridgewater approve the guarantee for the temporary borrowing resolution of the Bridgewater Public Service Commission for the borrowing of three million four hundred thirty three thousand three hundred dollars and for the purposes presented in document twenty four dash one four four. Thank you. Seconded by Deputy Mayor Fajir. All those in favor? Those opposed? Motion is carried. Thank you. Almost at the end, folks. Um, we're down to ten point ten. Uh, International Network of Michelin Cities Corridor of Incubation. <laughs> Good evening, Mayor and Council. Thank you very much for having the opportunity to bring this before you today. I will reference the notes. It certainly, as you've indicated earlier, it's included within the package. But I do want to set the stage. Are you ready for this? I know we're in for a couple of hours here so far. So <laughs> we still have another meeting after. <laughs> no pressure. So within the Bridgewater Inclusive Growth Strategy, priority goals specific to the business park expansion and business attraction and growth strategy. Uh, 
we've identified that we need to move in these directions. It's within our strategic plan. While there are many initiatives supporting the achievement of these goals since 2018, our membership within the International Network of Michelin Cities has presented an opportunity for council, municipal leaders, or sorry, for a city and municipal leaders to connect and build new relationships uh, that further strengthen those formed from among staff and other organizations. Now we're pleased and presented with an opportunity to embark on a new relationship within the International Network of Michelin Cities. It's specific to connecting businesses and helping us with their business attraction and growth. It all ties in and loops in with part and parcel of the National ne International Network of Michelin Cities and our fellow members. While in attendance at the INMC Biannual General Assembly, which is what they call the conference in Anderson, South Carolina in April of 2024, the INMC announced their aspiration to establish a reciprocal agreement for an international, ac international acceleration corridor of the INMC members. Seeing the potential to create an international connection for the town of Bridgewater in our economic development efforts, an expression of interest, of course, was expressed uh, on our behalf within the international network. In June, of June, in June of earlier this year, as a member of Good Standing, the INMC has invited the town of Bridgewater to be a founding signatory among a collection of seven of the 23 member cities. Having received a formal letter of agreement, the contract for signature, which is included in this package, staff is seeking approval from council to accept the invitation, authorizing CAO, Tammy Crowder, to sign on behalf of the town and to enable myself as your economic development officer to engage and leverage the opportunity on behalf of the town of Bridgewater to participate specifically in the reciprocal agreement for an international acceleration corridor within the INMC. Now I know most of you are very familiar with the background tied to this, um, it's not new to you. We've certainly benefited from Mayor Mitchell's presence since I believe 2018 around that table and helping to guide the direction and again the organization has grown to 23 cities. Specifically the INMC has been formed to try and facilitate, um, well it was launched first and foremost by the city of Clermont-Ferrand uh, to boost joint reflections and collaborative projects between cities from all over the world strengthening international exchanges that exist thanks to the presence of a Michelin plant of which we have within our community. At a time when environmental, social, digital, and cultural global challenges are emerging worldwide, INMC encourages innovation and creativity to take the lead in the transition to sustainable development. So again, acknowledging that while INMC is affiliated with Michelin, it is not directly connected to Michelin. This is because there are cities who have these plants within their cities They've unified and 23 of them have come together. Thus, we're working collaboratively to leverage strengths, opportunities, and make connections that foster other relationships, including economic activity. Signing on on this inaugural agreement, we would see ourselves as the town of Bridgewater collaborating directly with Magog Technopol, Technopol in Magog, Quebec, with Carmont Avogin in Innovation, Mm -hmm. which is with the city of Clermont-Ferrand, France, Startup Braga with the city of Braga, Portugal, Tech Base Regensburg, city of Res Regensburg, Germany, the Picto County Partnership, the town of Picto here in Nova Scotia, and the city of Victoria Gastes, Gastes, yeah. Gastes Spain. So as you can see, there's an eclectic and very unique collection that are signing on initially, wanting to sign on initially to facilitate this. Again, our opportunity here and inside the agreement, the goal is that businesses within our area who are interested in strengthening or looking at startups, expansions, and growing in other partnering cities, they would have the opportunity for a soft landing. Reciprocating that would be our opportunity. Mm -hmm. If we're seeking specific businesses or have, as we look to expanding exit 12A, as well as the existing businesses here who are looking to attract a partner or a collaboration as part of our, our federal, uh, or sorry, our foreign direct investment and related, we would have create that corridor of opportunity. At the essence of the agreement is the opportunity to bring 
a business who wants to look at relocating here, typically within an entrepreneurial side, but having started up and been in business for five to seven years, we would welcome them here. They would stay upwards of 10 days. We would provide connections, collaborations, virtually with the exception of the 10 day, which is supported and paid for by the company that's coming here. The INMC would help support their travel here and providing some of that endorsement. What we do on this end is what we do every day anyway with any other business that's interested in coming here. We meet with them, identify what their needs are, make connections for them, pull in our partners, whether it be Invest Nova Scotia or Federal through OCOA, depending on what their needs are. We naturally do this in any case. What is not done naturally is that we would have a, a collaborative approach for at least the next two years in place with the opportunity to extend it by one more year to work directly with seven cities internationally to grow our presence and create that corridor for collaboration and not only for those businesses but certainly amongst the cities and the officials that we're working with and the organizations that are facilitating economic development at that level. So it's our hope that uh, you will entertain the recommendation this evening which is to enable us to sign that agreement and to begin that process. Above and beyond what we normally do, any financial um, implications that we may need to consider would be brought back to you but most likely it would be tied within our existing budget already. So incrementally, it's not there, fiscally. At the same time, it is from our, our time and commitment and just continuing to build out from there. So I'm not sure if there are any questions specific to that, but it's a very exciting time for us, should you wish to endorse our, our recommendation to proceed. Any questions of our economic development officer? On this? I'm, I'm <laughs> I'm excited. I'm excited. Um, and, you know, I would say that this comes out of a, the conference that we were just at. So when people say, you go to these conferences, does anything ever come out of these conferences? That's what this is. So And we could choose, like the others, not to jump in and proceed. But we're hungry for development. We're hungry to strengthen those relationships with other cities that have Michelins, to look for those collaborations. And this does give us that opportunity to begin the process. We also know from, I, I know our Director of Community Development has been to an INMC conference. I know um, Councillor Tanner has been to an INMC conference. And from those, we've seen that the businesses that are linked with Michelin's in other cities, we don't have here. We often wonder, you know, what is it, you know, Michelin has 1,200 direct jobs here and, and thousands of indirect jobs. But there are organizations and companies in other jurisdictions that have found a way to work with Michelin on non-tire related things that we're just, we're not doing here. Mm -hmm. And so the ability to have perhaps one of those existing entities in Ravensburg, Germany say, well, if I put down roots in Nova Scotia, I can do what I'm doing there, do it here, create a few hundred jobs. Like, to me, that's, that's where I see- It is about the networking. My, my mind just swims with the possibility of, of something like that. So anyway, I just, I'm excited for that, but I get excited about this INMC <laughs> stuff. So. Is someone prepared to make a motion? Councillor Caldwell, thank you. I move the Town Council for the Town of Bridgewater become a signatory and active participant in the reciprocal agreement for an international accelerated corridor of international network of Michelin cities for a term of 24 months ending April 2026, renewable for a one year term ending on April 2027, leveraging the opportunity to support business retention and attraction on an international level as a tool within our economic development efforts. Seconded by Councilor Seconded Tanner. <coughs> All those in favor? Those opposed? Motion is carried. Thank you. Thank you. Down to our last item, um, street encroachment license for 678 Lahave. Hmm. Um, so yes, there, there is a bylaw uh, respecting the encroachment license um, for, uh, that is in place uh, where council, uh, uh, the license will not be issued unless council uh, does authorize it. It does provide, the bylaw does provide the town engineer with uh, some leeway uh, on exceptions. However, in this case, those exceptions don't apply, so that's why I'm here tonight. Uh, the property owner at 678 Behave Street. I noticed there is a typo in the 
discussion session, so just to clarify, it's 678, my apologies, um, has requested a, a license for the installation of a perimeter fence. Uh, that fence will be approximately 200 feet long, 8 feet high, uh, and a portion of it would be installed within the Lake Street Street right of way, really basically at the edge of the parking lot. Um, so we staff do not anticipate that there will be any impact on infrastructure, noting that they should do a service request, a service locate request, so they don't damage their, uh, their own services uh, to the property. Um, and we don't envision any site line, uh, site vision requests as long as they follow the, the permitting process under the land use bylaw. The size of the encroachment is approximately 1,650 square feet. Uh, the cost related to that, uh, 30 cents per square feet for the license, so it's about $495 of revenue. And then there would be an annual renewal cost uh, of approximately $165, $165 per year. Uh, with the understanding that uh, council may, uh, or may elect or not elect to authorize this encroachment, and under Section 5.4 of the bylaw, they may elect at sole discretion to cancel in the encroachment license at any time without notice. Uh, staff would make the recommendation uh, to town council, to town council, that they endorse the endorse uh, the encroachment license for 678 Lake Hayes Street for the installation of the perimeter fence, security fence. Uh, I have included the attach uh, a sketch from the property owner, uh, as well as an aerial photography to give you an idea. Uh, that's the main part of this. Uh, if you look at the yellow line, which would be the property boundaries, you can already see that their parking lot already extends into the right way, and the fence would be installed right at the edge of that asphalt uh, parking along the edge. Well, they're proposing to. Sorry. Questions for the engineer? If not, someone prepared to make a motion? Councillor okay. Caldwell. I move the town council for the town of Bridgewater endorse the recommendation of the engineering department and approve an encroachment license for 678 LaHave Street for the installation of a perimeter security fence. Seconded by Councillor Tanner. All those in favor? And those opposed? Motion is carried. Thank, Thank you. you. Um, that brings us to the end of our council meeting. Uh, we have our next discussion session is September 3rd. Um, we do have an in-camera with multiple items following Section 22.2 A, C, and E under the Municipal Government Act. Uh, and then we don't have, uh, so yeah, so our next meeting is September. So just a reminder that um, this is our last meeting for this month. Mm -hmm. And I have a motion to adjourn, please. So Councilor Thorburn, seconded by Councilor McDonald. We are adjourned. Thank you.